Hey footy fans, welcome to the Point of Difference Rugby League podcast. I'm your host Dave and today we're going back in the day with an absolute legend, uh, Kiwi and Canterbury coach, Phil Prescott. How are you going mate? Good thanks Dave. It's been a bloody hot summer, have you been enjoying it so far? Yeah, well it started off a bit indifferent but it's certainly come right now. Um, get rid of those easterly winds and we're going alright. Yeah, that'd be great wouldn't it? You know, especially for us runners, we don't like the easterly winds. But um, <laughs> What have you been getting up to post footy career? What do you do with yourself these days? Oh, just working really. Um, I mean, obviously coaching Premier Football, uh, the Canterbury Bulls and a, few, a bit of New Zealand representative stuff. It took up a lot of time and a lot of weekends, particularly through the, uh, through the Bulls era, um, you're away for a good part of the weekend. So it's nice just being able to be at home and spend time and just relax, really. Uh, That's the way. Probably done all the flying that I ever needed to do way back then. Yep, and you're still working or you're just chilling out these days? Uh, no, I'm still working. Uh, I work for a meat processing company, Ansco. Oh, um, yes. At uh, a plant that's supposedly in Rakaia, but it's between Leaston and Rakaia, so uh, I supervise the slaughter board um, mm-hmm. and, yeah, soon to be retired. Oh, mate, how good's that? No, it's going to be all right. Any big plans for retirement? Oh, not really. My wife, um, she's 65 at the end of the year, so uh, next, not this winter, but next winter, we'll be doing a 10 to 12 week uh, journey to to Europe, and we've been there a few times before, so we'll get one more of them under the belt, and um, yeah, retire. Kick back with a few cold ones. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. How good's that? Okay, so... Uh, before we kick off uh, going all the way back to the start, I want to ask you about the Kiwis' massive win in the Pacific Championship at the end of last year. Um, the main question I want to know is, how did they go from losing the semi-final so badly to beating the Australians a week later, 30 nil? Well, who knows? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, obviously, it, it was there. Um, for whatever reason, it, uh, it wasn't there previous. But on that day... Um, it certainly yeah. arrived. I was actually um, actually at a wedding uh, that day um, mm-hmm. up in the Greta Valley, um, and another uh, league person uh, was there, Cliff Lenny, who used to play for Linwood and Canterbury, and um, right. he was he was about the only person I knew at the wedding really. So we, we had a good day, but um, he said uh, one of his mates said, "Oh, it's." Um, he, he, Give us a half time score. I think it was 16 nil, was it? Something yeah, like that. Something like said, that. oh, it's 16 nil uh, to the Kiwis because there was uh, limited coverage out there. And we just looked at each other and said, yeah, right. So we thought it was a wind up. <laughs> and then later on, the bloke came back and said, oh, the, the game's over. It's 30 nil. Wow. And we both said, yeah, right. You know, <laughs> and we just, yeah. yeah it you- obviously was, and, um, and deservedly so on the day. Yeah. So during your coaching career, like, have you had teams you've coached where one week they've just been absolutely diabolical and come back the next week with a resounding win? Like, is there anything a coach can do to sort of turn a team around like that that you've seen or come across? Well, usually, you know, if it's a weekly type thing, you're playing different opposition, um, obviously, the next week. Um, but we had one experience with, uh, with the New Zealand uh, residents or New Zealand A team. I think it was 2005. Um, we had what we thought was a good team and mm-hmm. we played our first game in Wollongong against uh, New South Wales Country. And oh. they had um, Craig Field and Matt Parsons oh, who who had played. just, you know, the previous year they'd been playing NRL. And, mm-hmm. and we had a good side um, and they lapped us 34-4. <laughs> wow. Um, so you know they blew us off the park. It was it was a Matt Parsons and Craig Field show. Really. And they were it was pretty great. old then, you know. Well, yeah, but they certainly weren't past it. Right. Um, so you know you you lick in your wounds, and uh, I actually said to the team after the game that um, because we were playing a week or two later against uh, a New South Wales Cup team, mm-hmm. um, and that was going to be in Auckland. Um, I told them that we would keep the same team because. I just knew, well, I selected that team with along with Shane Cooper. Right. And after talking to him, I told them that we were going to uh, keep the same team and give them a chance to, you know... Um, turn it around. Turn it around. Yeah. And then we played this New South Wales Cup team in Auckland, and it was, it was a good side. Um, 
as strong, if not stronger than the New, uh, than the New South Wales country, yeah. and and we got to win. So you know, in a couple of weeks, we managed to turn that around. But wow. um, I always thought it was there. It was just yep. for whatever reason. I mean, the day in Wollongong, it was um, it was early October, so it was probably about the first weekend in October. Uh, um, and it was about 34 degrees. Yeah, and, you know, that's um, tough. <laughs> that's pretty tough. Um, yeah, so we got we got um, dealt to. Oh, well. Oh, that's awesome, man. Okay, so let's go all the way back to the beginning. Where did you grow up and what was the young Phil Prescott like? What was it like for you growing up as a young fellow? I know you have to ask other people that. But uh, <laughs> now I was born in, um, I was born in Waikari, uh, North Canterbury. I uh, lived in Waipara with uh, my parents and my sister Diane until uh, I was about five, 1962, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. My parents bought a house in, uh, in Oaklands or Horswell and we shifted there. Um, my father worked on the railway at Waipara and, and did so at Addington. Oh, cool. um, I went to Horswell School for the first couple of years in the schooling and then uh, about 64, Oakland School opened and went there and that was uh nice. that was the start of it well wow. so basically uh lived in horsewall until uh i got married uh, yeah. in 1980 and then yeah still here well not living in horsewall no. but living in rolleston and oh, nice um, still going to the horsewall club and yeah still enjoying it oh that's awesome man um okay so when did you fall in love with rugby league like when did you start playing and what made you keep going well, I started playing, and I, I can't really remember. I knew, like I wasn't a, I wasn't a six or a seven year old. Uh, um, I, I think I started about nine when I was about nine, um, mm -hmm. playing for Horsell, um because uh, going to Oakland School, the the kids in my class, um, a lot of them were playing playing league, and, mm -hmm. and obviously got dra dragged along. Our family had no car. Um, and so the Horsell Domain was a, thrown, a stone's throw away. Yeah. Um, and obviously there was enough appearance to get us around um, on game day. So oh, nice. I started when I was about nine. I can remember that I started in a team um, that wasn't great. You yeah. Know, we didn't win many games. <laughs> um, but luckily for me and uh, a few other blokes in the team, um, they changed the, the age bracket. Um, and I'm not sure when that was. I must have been about 11, I think. Um, so you used to, the age you were turning, uh, well, I think it was March, and they turned that back to to the 1st of January. Oh, right. So that meant that I could drop down a, a year, mm -hmm. and um, as luck would have it, the team that was a year below was a good team. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, and we used to win most games, so that was quite refreshing. And <laughs> as, a, as a 12 year old, um, we won the competition um, and we were coached by a couple of the players' mm -hmm. fathers, um, Zane Marhoff and Lester Lightfoot, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, good men. Yeah. And they looked after us. Oh, um, that's awesome. But going back to the Horsell Club, really, I mean, and I'm not saying Horsell's better than any other club, but there's so many families, and particularly through the 60s when, when the club started. So the club started, um, as I understand it, from uh, three or four disgruntled Hornby um, <laughs> people um, that come over and kick the club off. And, wow. and like every club, there's, there's three or four families that are, are the backbone of it. Mm -hmm. And Horswell were lucky. They had uh, people like the, the Harris family, the Woods family, um, uh, Lightfoots, um, the Woolhouses, um, and later on the Whitakers. Um, yep. That and another bloke that played a big part um, later on was Reg Wakefield and his family. So we're very lucky that in that community we had those families that, for no recompense, yeah. were prepared to put their shoulder to the wheel and um, create opportunities for yeah. kids like myself. Oh, that's amazing! And would you say? There was much exposure for Canterbury Rugby League back then? Um, well, yeah, I wasn't really aware of it as a kid, you know, like um, obviously Horsell. Horsell had no premier team. Um, I'm not even sure what it might have been senior first or something they called it way back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, so really, I mean, you used to read about the Kiwis and, and Canterbury and I've got to say that, you know, I went to a lot of Canterbury games because... Um, 
you know, kids in our team, their parents would say, you know, do you want to come down and watch Canterbury? So you'd, you'd get a ride and you'd go yeah. down and and it just sort of kindled an interest, really. Uh-huh. Um, I don't think I've ever... I don't think I've ever been in love with the rugby league. Okay. I've really liked it, you know, yeah. and I've liked the com- camaraderie and um, I've liked the team aspect of it. Awesome. So what position did you play coming through the grades? Well... Oh, coming through the grades, um, as a kid, I was always in the backs, um, mm-hmm. centres, fullback, wing. Uh, didn't play a lot of wing because I was never fast enough. Right. But, uh, later on, played a lot of five eight. Um, uh-huh. But yeah, right. you're playmaker. But, but um, you know, once once I got to premier football, it was pretty much locked second mm-hmm. row. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, nice. So what achievements did you have coming up through the grades? Is there anything that stood out in your comps you won or like as, as a young fella before premiers? Uh, not really. I mean, there's that 12-year-old competition. Yeah. Um, it was big in the day for when you were a 12-year-old. <laughs> um, no, there's that. I mean, we, we really had teams that competed, but we weren't going to win competitions. The 15-year-olds, uh, we went all right. I remember in the 15-year-olds, they had a, uh, a tournament one school holidays um, and it was it was club-based, but uh, it was initiative by Canberra League, Rugby League, sorry, at the mm-hmm. time. Um, you could get kids from your school or whatever. They had, weren't playing league and you could they could be part of it. Yeah. And uh, I think we made the final of that that competition um, with a couple of ring-ins um, yeah. but other than that I mean we got 15 16s that was schoolboy football um, and then once you got to 17 you started playing in the afternoon um, right. yeah I, I don't think um, I mean the people that coached us they were doing the best they could but um, we they probably didn't have the exposure to coaching techniques and, and all the rest of it that come along a bit later. Right. Um, yeah. Cool. So in 1977, you actually captained Hallsville to a Premier Grade Grand Final victory. So was that the first big trophy? Yeah, well, uh, just, uh, just uh, yeah, it was. Um, I mean, in the 17s and, and 19s, so you played two years in each grade. Yes. Um, 17s, we got, um, we had a bloke coaching us that, that had come down from Auckland and was related to a to a fellow that was in our team, Bernie Jordan. Mm-hmm. Um, it was Bernie's uncle, John Townsend, and so he'd come from Auckland. And of course, we all perceived that you know that's that's where it happens, Auckland. Yeah. Um, but he was he was he was more um, on the coaching line of it than anybody we'd had before. Yeah. Um, with all due respect, um, just because of the exposure he'd had, I suppose. So he taught us quite a bit about the game and yeah. uh, techniques and, and stuff like that. Um, and once again, we were competitive. Yep. Um, we didn't win anything. Um, and then through the 19s, uh, we had a, a bloke that um, had played Premier B football for Horsall, uh, Barry Robinson. Mm-hmm. And he was, he was good also. Um, so over those last four or five years of that age group football, we got, um, we got some good tuition. And then um, we went, uh, so 1977 would have been our first. So what happened, to wheel it back a bit, sorry. So the club, um, when we were in the 19-year-old grade, there was three or four of us that used to play regularly for the senior team, okay. um, which was only Premier Bs at that stage, but we were playing growing men. And, yeah, um, <laughs> step up. <laughs> and you, got, you did get knocked around, you know, <laughs> so... Um, it, it, that aspect of it was good, yeah. um, but the club, um, and I think it was pretty much Reg Wakefield, said we need to keep those blokes playing in that grade together because mm-hmm. they are going to be the, the future of the club. So right. we only got to play spasmodically. Um, and then, so 1977, like you're saying, was uh, our first year out of the 19-year-old grade and Horswell, um, Horswell only had, only went to Premier Bs at that stage. Okay. Um, and... I don't know for whatever reason, but Reg Wakefield, uh, this man I'm talking about, um, you know, get a bit emotional about the bloke because yeah. he was a he was a great man. Um, right. But he's seen, or well, he must have seen something in me that I didn't even know about anyway. But um, so he made me captain of the team first year out of uh, 19 to wow. 20 years of age. Um, 
that probably wouldn't have happened. Uh, we had another player that played through the grades with us, um, David Baxter, who was a far better player than any of us. Right. Um, but he had a bad, uh, bad accident on a motorbike um, at the end of the 19-year-old grade, and he spent a lot of time in hospital. Oh, wow. Um, he'd done a lot of damage to his leg, and uh, unfortunately for Dave, uh, although he did play after that, um, he probably wasn't quite the player he was because of the injury. So... I'm thinking that if Dave was available, then he would have been the captain in okay. 1977, and I would have been um, I would have been a player. Yeah. Um, but I was the captain uh, at 20 years of age, and never been a captain before. And you're captaining blokes at 30, 32 years of yeah. age, so um, I haven't got too many memories of it. Uh, but obviously, um, this man Ridge Wakefield seen something and. Um, he probably took a shine to me because, wheeling it back further, I used to give a, a mate of mine a hand on a paper run um, in Horsall when I was yeah. 12 or 13, and he had uh, he had twin sons, and we used to take them with us sometimes on their bikes right. around the paper run and yeah. then deliver them back home, you know, so we oh, probably cool. got them out of his hair for a probably, while. Probably, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you know, he, he, yeah, and I always sort of um, had something going with the man, yeah. you know. Did you like the responsibility of captain? I can't really remember. <laughs> fair enough. To be fair honest, enough. you know, um, we we had a good team, and there was it was a pretty tough grade. I mean, it wasn't premier football, but um, there was a lot of blokes on the way up and a lot of blokes on the way down, and the, right. the blokes on the way down knew what they were doing. Yeah. Um, and we had um, we had pretty reasonable competition against Hornby. You know, um, the uh, the rivalry or whatever yeah. was starting to. Um, Starting to get, starting to accumulate. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Love it. Good. Love it. <laughs> okay. So uh, you ended up doing some schoolboy coaching at the same time as playing. So how on earth did you manage to juggle both? And were you finding success with your methods of coaching? Um, well, I don't know how you how you juggle it, but it, it just happened. And um, yeah. the first time I, I would have been still playing in the 19s, and I actually ended up coaching for two years the team that Reg's boys played in. Um, yeah, we had no success, but, um, yeah, it, um, that was the first go at it. Um, then I never really coached again until I think it was, um, I'm trying to remember now, it, it would have been about 1980, 79. Mm -hmm. So 79, we went to premiers, and there was a... There was a bloke that was coaching a 13-year-old team. Um, I can't even remember his name now, but he said to me, oh, would you come and give me a hand? So right. I said, yeah, right. So at the end of that year, I helped him, but at the end of that year, he was moving on. Okay. Um, he was moving up north somewhere. So he said to me, why don't you coach this team next year? So that would have been 1980. Um, and I said, oh, yeah, okay. So actually in that grade, so that would have been... It would have been the 14-year-old grade the next year. So in that grade, Horsall and the 13s had two teams. Okay. So come 1980, they only uh, they only had enough because, you know, kids are getting, getting a bit older and league's not for them or whatever. Right. So we only had enough for one team, and mm -hmm. I ended up coaching that team. So right. out of two average teams, we got a good team. Nice. We got a good team. It's not and, a bad way uh, to go, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, I think the first year... Um, we lost, I might have lost one or two games. Um, we won the, won the final. Nice. Um, and then that team went on to win uh, over 50 games without losing. Wow. Um, but that wasn't only on me. Like, they carried on and I coached them in the 14s, 15s and 16s mm -hmm. with, uh, with the bloke I mentioned before, Bernie Jordan, who was mm -hmm. playing premiers as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I coached them for those three years and then Barry Owens, another bloke that was playing uh, who, who played in the first Horsall Premier team, um, he took them over because he'd finished playing and they continued winning under Barry. And there was there was three or four or five players in that team that, um, well, there might have been more actually, might have been half a dozen that went on to play Premier football oh. and be successful for Horsall and further. You know? That's awesome, so, man. Um, awesome. That was good. It gives you a lot of satisfaction. Yeah, it would do. would do. So you ended up playing for Horsall till the end of 1982. 
uh, when you made the switch to Addington. Mm. So why the change and what was it like going to a, a rival club? Well, I mean, we made premiers in 79 and we uh, and they got a they got a, uh, a bloke in to play a coach us, um, Lester Wilson, mm-hmm. who was probably at the, at the as prime. Right. Um, so Lester had played for played for Limwood on. I think he had played for Canterbury, but he played in New Zealand age group sides through the thing. Okay. And uh, Lester was um, he is one he's one t- tough ombre. Lester. Yep. Lester played in the front row. 79, I think. Um, so when we went in, it made nine teams in the competition. Okay. Um, the uh, the previously had been promotion and relegation, but because of the way Horsall was trending with schoolboys and everything like that, the Canterbury Rugby, Rugby League decided to take us up there and make nine teams instead of eight. Nice. And once again, I like they got Leicester, and uh, we had somebody that took a lot of bruises for us because we yeah. we uh, we obviously struggled. I'm not sure how many games we won the first year. I, I think it, the first win was against Addington. I know we beat Hornby that year. Um, and, yeah, so Leicester coached us for two years. Um, and then, uh, I should say, really, the first year Leicester coached us, he, he played for Canterbury while coaching us and playing, and he was the top try scorer in the Premiership wow. competition out of the bottom team. You That's know? crazy. And, uh, yeah, he... Yeah, he was uh, he was pretty. one tough body. Yeah, um, and then after a couple of years, um, obviously I don't, I'm not even sure of the circumstances. Um, uh, Lester he went back to Limwood, so we ended up playing against them. But yeah. um, then uh, uh, they Trevor Williams, who who used to play for Hornby and played a lot of Premier football. I'm not sure whether Trevor played for Canterbury back in the day. He had a he had a tremendous boot on him, like he, Trevor used to back in the day would kick uh, kick goals from from the halfway Crazy. with plenty of with plenty of extra on them. Really? Um, <laughs> wow! And they would have been the leather ball and stuff back yeah, then. Yeah, That's mental. Yeah, wow! All conditions. Um, so Trevor was a good player himself. No two worries. No two ways about that. Then, uh, so eighty two wasn't a hell of a successful. Um, no, sorry, no, it wouldn't have been. It wouldn't have been then. Sorry, it was seventy nine and eighty. Leicester coached us, and eighty one. Kevin Williams. Sorry, this is a pretty important part. Kevin Williams. He coached us, and um, we were we we were going up the table. Well, I'm not sure exactly where we finished. We didn't finish in the top four, um, but uh, we. We made progress off the bottom, and uh, we probably finished mid-table. Right. Um, and then, um, for whatever reason, so when when Her- well, Kevin Herman to everybody, um, the end of the year come, and he only had a, a, a con- well, it wouldn't be a contract, but he only he'd only be given the job for one year, and then it was going to be reassessed. I okay. Why I don't know. Um, and because we'd improved and everything like that uh, he was invited along to a uh, to a meeting with the, the committee and um, for whatever reason um, because he was <laughs> he was fairly fairly single-minded um, right. but that's not bad um, so he decided that you know he didn't think that um, he didn't think that he needed to go um, okay. and they thought he did um, right he, he only had to turn up to that, and he would have been he would have been the coaching in the next year. So, <laughs> okay. so he missed out because he never turned up, and um, Trevor Williams got the the coaching job in '82. Okay. Um, and as I said, uh, it wasn't a hell of a successful year. And in the meantime, Herman, who I certainly had a lot of time for, and he he worked at the freezing works like I did at Islington, and we you seen him every day of the every day of the week. And yeah. um, he said to me, um, he'd he'd actually uh, he was still playing, so he decided that he was going to go to Addington. He'd come from Papua Nui, um, yep. and amongst a, 
their very successful era, era mm. with Rod Walker and Mark Broadhurst and yeah, Eddie Kerrigan Broadhurst, and yeah. Gary Ty and yeah. all those blokes. So he'd, he'd come out of a successful club and, and he decided that he was going to carry on at Addington and he just said to me, uh, why don't you come and play for Addington, you know? Um, this is, this is in, at the end of 82, the start of 83. Um, and I thought, well, it wasn't something that I'd really thought about. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, just, you know, come and play. And and Frank Endicott was coaching them, so he had to talk to Frank. And mm -hmm. Frank had said to him, yeah, if he wants to come over, he, you know, he's more than welcome. There's no, no money. I was never going to get no. paid. I didn't want to be paid. And um, so that's what happened. And um, this is one of the sad, sad parts about it is, I'm letting down the bloke who's now the president of the club, Reg Wakefield, who, you know, had put some time into me right. know, because he's the president of the club and I'm going to tell him, mate, I'm off uh, to play for Addington. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, played for Addington, um, played every game that year in, yep. in the Premier team. They'd won the grand final the year before. Right. It's not, not the reason that I went there, but um, certainly... Um, off the players, um, I learned more about preparation and okay. at, even at premier level, you know, like um, just preparing for a game and, and training and, and the rest of it. Um, mm -hmm. So we made, uh, we made the playoffs um, and we got, uh, we got beaten by uh, Hornby um, and put out. So, you know, realistically, we were probably the third best team, right. um, but certainly enjoyed yeah. Uh, one year, and at the end of that year, Frank um, Frank was uh, moving on. He was going to coach Hornby, um, and in the meantime, um, Herman had applied again for the Horsell job. Right. So this is coming end back. Of the, yeah. End of the '83 season, the start of '84. Yeah. Um, and uh, so he ended up getting the job, and then um, was probably a no-brainer. He um, once again work, you know. You're coming back. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then all through this time, there's another team coming through the grades that uh, at Horsell um, who were successful. Um, so they're in the 19-year-old grade mm -hmm. and uh, coached by another great club man, uh, Keith Grew. His son, Glenn or Bert, was playing in the team and they had what was going to be half a dozen players or more to supply to the premier right. team, and they were going to be more than uh, they were going to be more than able to to handle the level. So, yep. um, all of a sudden, from I think Horse will finish pretty much the bottom of the table, uh, eighty three. So, all of a sudden, in eighty four, um, we started to make some progress, and I think uh, I think we finished second. In the yeah, you went all the way to the grand final. Yeah, you were well, captain. Yeah. Uh, eighty four, yeah, yep. it, it wasn't it wasn't a it wasn't a great playoff uh, series for myself. Uh, obviously, uh, Herman had come back from um, from Addington, and at Addington at the time, we had a, there was a young bloke who played five eight, Phil Bancroft, mm -hmm. um, coming through, yep. um, and he had a relationship with Herman, so he ended up coming to Horsell as well through eighty four. So we had. We had uh, probably six or seven blokes that were fresh out of 19-year-old grade but uh, had all the enthusiasm. We yeah. had a coach a coach that had all the enthusiasm and um, he delivered the discipline. Um, uh -huh. And we pretty much... We pretty much revolved around defence, um, you know. As all great teams yeah, do. And uh, yeah. that's where it started. Um, so in the playoffs... Um, we finished second, so obviously we played. We played Hornby uh, first. They they they'd finished first in the competition, um, so we played them first. Um, yeah, it was quite a spiteful year regarding the two clubs. So for whatever reason, you know, I, I don't know. There was yeah, it didn't need to happen. Um, so in the in that semi final, I broke my hand mm -hmm. and. I should never have played a couple of weeks later. I wasn't, yeah, yeah I was probably a bit selfish, really. Um, Interesting. And um, although, you know, we, we, I think 
I think we beat them twice. We beat them the last time we played them in the, in the competition in mm -hmm. 84 and we beat them in the first semi-final to go straight into the grand final. Oh, right. Probably the worst thing that happened to us was that we, we had a week off. You Lost know, your momentum. Well, yeah, I don't know, you know, because really none of us had, even at that level, had experienced that before. Okay. And it gives you a chance to get ahead of yourself, you know. Um, I guess in, like, in the NRL, I suppose, these days, it's great to freshen up, but they've, most of them have got all those games of experience under oh, their belt, you know. Oh, give me a week yeah. off any day of the week, but <laughs> yeah. I just don't think it was... I just don't think it was right that year. I think we would have been... The way we played, it was... Um, it, it was like I said. It was defence come first, and it was um, you know you just got to be tougher than the rest, and you right. just got to hang in there. And I think you know we probably might have been better if we um, if we had played uh, another week. Um, but as I said, you know from my part, I, you know I was probably a bit selfish because uh, come grand final day, I was probably just a passenger really um yeah um and i actually got replaced with about 20 minutes to go oh, really? uh, and you know it's not a, it's not a nice taste no um, it wouldn't be so uh you, you sort of you know you you reflect on that and you you're thinking to yourself well if we've this ever happens again this ain't this ain't happening again well i guess there's two mindsets you could have you can have one i'm i'm gonna perform with this broken hand to help my team well, there's the other side of the coin. You go, oh, I don't want to miss a grand final. Is that yeah, kind of the conundrum yeah, you yeah. found yourself just, in? Yeah, you just, yeah. Well, yeah, I thought I was all right. But as soon as you get out there and, you know, we weren't getting injections or anything like that. So, <laughs> oh, um, oh, it must have know, hurt. So, you know, once uh, you get a, you get one knock and you're back to square one, basically. Yeah. But, right. you know, that's... Uh, you know, that's only excuses, but there you go. Well, so in 85, you went one better. You kept yeah, them all the way to the premiership. How good's yeah, that? 85 was great. Yeah, was tell great. us about 85. So, well, uh, uh, 85, I think we pretty much uh, we pretty much won everything. We we won the Radio Avon tournament, a pre-season tournament they used to play before the competition kicked right. off. Um, and it's certainly uh, the, the way we were prepared and the way we trained, I mean, we always trained hard. Mm -hmm. uh, Herman was, uh, you know, he always got his pint of blood out here. Um, <laughs> so we always trained hard um, and we were probably more disciplined than we were the year before. Yep. Um, we didn't want to make the same mistakes we made the year before. We had basically the same team. Um, and then, you know, um, things started to fall into place for us. So nice. we, we never took anything for granted. I mean, um, f for all intents and purposes, way back then, um, with the green belt between Hunay and Horsall, we were just, well, you like to term it as country. Um, yeah. And I don't like to think we got ahead of ourselves. And the way the um, the way the season finished off was um, was great in the respect that we played. Um, so Hornby ended up winning the competition. They were first, they were seeded oh, first. Right. Um, but we played them three weeks or three games in a row. So we played them the last game of the premiership mm -hmm. and we beat them. Right. Then we played them the first playoff game and beat them. Yep. I, I'm not, a, I can't remember what the scores were. And then we played them in the grand final and obviously uh, won the, that. Beat uh, the game. <laughs> right on full time with a, with a field goal. Oh, you, you're kidding. Yeah. Uh, well, as the Phil Bancroft kicked the field goal, um, yeah. so... The hoot is going. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not even sure what tackle it was, but we had the ball, obviously. Uh, we were 10 metres inside their, uh, inside their half. Yeah. And it would be the ugliest drop kick you've ever seen in your life. Like it, There was no rotation of the ball while there oh. was a rotation, but it was, it was like this. And, uh, you know, it got carried over somehow. And, That's um, amazing. Well, the best part of it was they had no... They had no uh, chance to reply to that, you know, yeah. because uh, the hooter was sounding and, and that was um, a... yeah, and everything went off then. That's amazing! Like yeah. what a like your dream of those moments as a kid playing and to actually to live out one of those like winning the final on the hooter yeah. with a field goal or a sideline conversion. You know, those that's the stuff that dreams are made of. You and know, against Hornby. Uh, yeah, yeah, and against the old foe. The, you know? the best part about it was it was. Um, Back then, you know, like it was all all kids from Horsell. Yeah. You know, so. um, you know there might have been Phil Bancroft, Murray Pitts, 
that had come from Maddington um, or Robbie Rushton. Um, but pretty much everybody else had grown up in Horsell and come through the grades. So and, you're playing um, for the jersey, aren't you? Uh, well, you love it. it was just so good because, you know, we we knew what sort of childhood we'd had out in that right. area. Yeah. Um, I mean, as a kid out there, you just, as soon as you got a push bite, you just free ranged. Yeah. And um, <laughs> it was, um, it was, yeah, it was pretty special um, for those people I'm talking, I talked about before, the yep. families that have put so much yeah. effort into the place. And um, as much as we were happy, it was nice to see them happy. Yeah, all their hard work and toiling in the background. Yeah. You no, know, seeing some success. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, nah, it was it was good. So it's all done for the love yeah, of the game yeah. and nothing yeah. else. Yeah. So um, yeah, basically that was um, that was going to be my last year um, because we'd start to have a family and yep. um, I hadn't even thought about coaching or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So we we were uh, you had to fin- the the top team. Uh, that team that finished first in the competition, they played for the Thacker Shield against the top coast side, so we never got okay. that opportunity. But we were in the, um, I'm not sure what they called it then, the Lion Red um, Cup or anything. Uh, yeah, it was a competition, um, a national competition, uh, so the top two Canterbury teams um, okay. uh, were in that. Mm-hmm. We played, uh, I think, uh, we played Upper Hutt here, Yep. And um, we lost six four, yeah. so we were out. Um, Pretty decent side, the old upper hut Tigers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that initially was going to be my last game of rugby league. I yeah. uh, decided that that you know that was that was it. Did you had one last one song uh, for Marist? Yeah, well, it's quite funny. Like, as I say, I I wasn't playing anymore, and I went to work one day at the, at the freezing works. This is. Oh, would have been in December or something that year, and a mate of mine said to me, "Oh, um, you're playing for Marist," and I said, "News to me," and, and it was, you know, and uh, I said, "News to me." He said, "Oh, I was talking to Chris Breton, and Chris was you know, going to coach Marist at that stage, and he told me that you're playing." And I said, "No." no. He said, "He hasn't talked to you." I said, "No, no." He said, "Oh, I think he's going to." So anyway. Um, yeah, Chris made contact and he talked to me about playing for Marist and um, I mean, yeah, I was, as I say, I wasn't going to play because of the family side of it. Um, there was a few dollars in, in the Marist thing. Um, for whatever reason, um, I decided I was going to do it. Yep. Um, once again, um, I had to go and tell Edge Wakefield that <laughs> I was going to play, but it wasn't going to be for Horsehawk. Right. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how many either. times he forgave me, but <laughs> um, yeah. So I played for Marist, and uh, and I love playing. For, I loved that year at Marist. It was such and not that the blokes I was playing with uh, weren't good blokes, but a lot of them were younger than than what I was. Right. Um, but I was playing at Marist with uh, Wayne O'Donnell, Skippy O'Donnell, mm-hmm. and Carl Wilde, John McGugan, and um, blokes like that. And, yeah. Um, yeah, they, they, were, they were good blokes. So you go around any rugby league club and you find the same sort of people. So, yeah. But I really enjoyed that. I mean, um, we had uh, Ray Baxendale was the masseur, Chris was the coach, Mocky was the, he was the president. And I remember... Um, First pre-season, uh, Jared Stokes was playing. Um, oh, wow. We, first pre-season training was at Waimari Beach and a bloke that was playing then who's not with us any longer, um, Chris Charlton, um, mm-hmm. he had a flat in, uh, in uh, North Beach. And yeah. so we were down on the beach training and I uh, was trained for about an hour and a half, um, as you do. And um, we're back in the car park getting ready to disperse mm-hmm. and uh mocky pulled up and he was it won't get him in trouble but he was in uh, he was in the police force then mocky so mocky pulled up in a in a squad car yeah. and um he said uh right boys all round to uh all round to charlie's place so chris had a had a flat one street off the beach right and uh so out of the boot of the squad car comes the alcohol, As and, you do. Uh, <laughs> and we uh, and we had an afternoon. So so that kicked the season off. We we um, we had a good team. Uh, we, we only finished mid table, um, but it was 
it was just great to play with people like Skippy and Good Wayne. way to go they, out. They mm. were, um, and we had another bloke that mm. played in the team, uh, Wayne Monday, who previously played for Hornby, and he was something else when he played for Hornby, but unfortunately he had had a car accident in the meantime, but he, yeah. he was playing for Marist. He was never the player he was at Hornby, but... He was a good player. Good player for you. He's a you, good player. You guys won the Gore Cup. So for those who don't know what the Gore Cup is, what exactly is it? Well, that's uh, that's the winners of the middle section, base. Oh, the middles, the winners. Sorry, of the of the bottom section. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so it's yeah. like a little comp within a comp. Well, yeah, they used to break it up into top four, bottom four, right? And top four a playoff for the Pat Smith Trophy, and the bottom right. four a playoff. For, so yeah, we were. I think we won. Uh, we won about ten or eleven games that year, which oh, you know was not bad at all. Wasn't bad, but it wasn't good enough. You no. Know? Yeah. Still. Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay, so 1987, you transitioned into coaching. So back then, was it like a full-time gig or did you still have to work? Or? Oh, no, always yeah. always worked. Um, so so 87, mm -hmm. um, obviously, I'd, um, when I went to Maris, the intention was to play um, for a couple of years mm -hmm. there. Um, but at the end of uh, 86, uh, Kevin Williams, Herman, he... He, he coached Horsville in 86, so he, he wasn't going to coach again. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he was going, or he went back to Pap Newey. Right. So obviously the Horsville coaching position become vacant. They'd, Horsville had made the grand final in 86 and, and lost to Hornby. Right. Um, and I, I can't even remember why or whatever, you know, like coaching that kids team, I wasn't thinking to myself, uh, you know, I'm going to coach Premier Football or whatever. And I don't even know whether somebody spoke to me or I can't remember that. But anyway, um, I decided to put in for the Horsall uh, coaching job in 87. I yep. didn't give myself much show, really. Really? Um, well, <laughs> having left the place a couple of times and gone back and... <laughs> You think that people's uh, people started to wear a bit thin of you, right. um, and I thought there might have been, uh, you know, some some people there that thought, you know, well, why would we give the job to him? So anyway, in uh, in eighty seven, I applied for it, and probably luckily for me, uh, Reg Wakefield was the president. Okay, and um, so I got the job, um, and yeah, um, the other the other thing for me, uh, the other fortunate part about it, because. I don't like talking about luck, but I like talking about good fortune. So I had, right. I was, um, I was getting a team that it wasn't an ordinary team; it was a good team. It's a decent um, side. And in amongst that, there was a there was a bloke who played in '85 and '86. Who was a who he had in '85. He would have only been about 19 or 20, but um, he was a PT instructor in the Air Force. Right, uh, Neil Sinclair. He, so. he played on the wing. So I was fortunate that he was there. So I knew that if I got this job, that I was going to be able to go to him, get programs, get yes. stuff. And um, although he would give it to me, I w I'd oversee it. So okay. um, I had no idea about um, training as such, you know. Right. Well, well training. Well, the but conditioning the side conditioning, of things. Conditioning, you know, the yeah. recovery and all that type of, right. type of thing. So. All of a sudden, I didn't have to worry about that. I yeah. had somebody, um, you know, I could rely on. Nice little um, secret weapon in your bag. Of yeah, tricks. so, yeah. Um, yeah, so '87, and uh, away we went. Um, before the season kicked off, um, as I said, we already had a what looked like a pretty good team on paper. Mm -hmm. um, one of the players who who was in the team, um, Chris White, known to everybody as Spinner. Right. Spinner come to me uh, just before Christmas, so it would be 86 Christmas, and he said to me, um, uh, Brendan Tudor wants to come and play next year because Spinner was pretty pretty tight with Brendan. Right. And Brendan was playing for Hornby. Okay. Uh, and I thought, oh, yeah, right. You know, like Frank was still coaching Hornby then. Yeah. Um, for the 87 season, I thought, oh, yeah, right. And, they're not gonna. They're not gonna let him go. Pretty handy player. Exactly. <laughs> um, well, you know, like Brendan would have only been twenty one or twenty two then, and he was all rip shit and bust. Yep. Um, but um, yeah, he, he's somebody that you'd rather have playing for you yep. than against <laughs> yeah. you. So I said, yeah. So I had a chat to Brendan, and and yeah, it was. Um, he was he was keen. Okay. Um, uh, then I thought, well. You know they got to give him a transfer. I didn't 
I didn't think it was going to happen. I don't, I don't know why it happened or how it happened, but it happened, and um, yeah, we were certainly uh, very, very pleased. Again. You know, we had, uh, we already, we were already covered in the halves. You know, yep. like uh, there was a young bloke that had come through that I'd coached through that uh, schoolboy side, Gary Pluck, who was oh yes, Aaron Whitaker mentioned him. He's uh, yeah. he was more than up to it, um, and we had Phil Bancroft still then. Yes, um, so. As far as the halves, we, we were we yeah. were covered. So we started the season off with uh, Brendan and um, and Phil in the halves, but um, yeah, it wasn't a, it wasn't a great fit in the respect to um, like Phil was will o' the wisp. Um, you know, a lot of the time um, you just you just went straight out the paddock because you never knew where he was going, mm -hmm. and half the time he never knew where he was right. going. You know, so. Um, <laughs> But when you got in a tight situation, he'd get you out of it. Okay. And Brendan, um, yeah, like I said, he, you know, Brendan at that stage, he was rip shit and bust. And um, so it probably wasn't, um, it wasn't an ideal 5-8 combination. Probably didn't give you that structure that you're looking for yeah, potentially. Yeah, well, it wasn't. <laughs> the, other, the other respect, uh, in, in the other respect, we had a good team, you know, like, mm. and as a coach, one thing I was mindful of is that when you get a good team, don't don't stuff it up. Don't break it. If yeah, it's don't not, stuff it know. up. You know what I mean? Because yeah. there's plenty of coaches that um, overcoach and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be one of those boys. Okay. I just wanted to. I wanted the team to be fit. Yep. Go right to the end mm -hmm. and point them in the right direction, you know, yeah. and work on some technique stuff and the rest of it. Nice. So, obviously, Phil and Brendan were playing uh, for Canterbury. Um, they were the they were the I'm pretty sure they were the half bat, the half combination for Canterbury then. Um, and then, so when they weren't there. We had other people in, in those positions, and one of them was Gary Pluck. And then mm -hmm. about half, or well, not halfway through the season, but a few games into the season, and those two hadn't been there. And um, I'm thinking to myself, you know, this this bloke's too good. He can't be he can't be sitting in the reserves every week. This is Gary Pluck. Mm -hmm. So they come back from one game, and um, I, I said uh, to Brendan, I said, uh, mate. This is what's happening, you know, and I don't see it as a good fit. And, and the communication wasn't what you'd what you'd like from mm -hmm. uh, the halves. Yep. Um, so I, I talked to him about playing at loose forward, and ah. he was uh, he was more than keen. Oh, cool! Because of the probably the way he was. Well, playing. if he likes going up the guts, yeah, that's well, perfect. The ball playing lock. Yeah, How he, good's that? Yeah, well, he had, he had plenty of skills, Brendan. Don't yep. worry about that. And he was quick and strong. Um, yep. um, so I thought it'd suit him, and uh, you know, he, he went on from there. So yeah, we had a um, we had a good season. Um, we won plenty of games. We finished first. I think you went to the grand final. Yeah, we were we went to the grand final, and once again, this is a this is another scenario of the Hornby thing. Um, so we played Hornby three weeks or three games in a row again. Yeah. Um, we played them in the last competition game, and uh, this day I think it was a Saturday we played, and we were down twelve 0 after five minutes. Oh, rough start. And, and, <laughs> um, so we're already gonna. We're already going to finish in the first two, you know. So we're down 12 nil, 12 nil after five minutes. And I thought, oh, well, this is going to be a long day at the office. And yep. um, whatever happens at the, end of the, at the end of the day, we're still going to be in the top two and we're still going to get two shots. Of right. And we ended up winning the game 35-12. So. Oh, we've turned it around. <laughs> and then we played them the week after in the um, first semi-final. And we beat them. I can't remember what the score was. Um, well, I think we beat them by about eight, eight to ten points right. or something like. That. So the score's coming down. Uh -huh. And then um, they they won the the next semi final. I can't remember who they played. And then we played them in the grand final. Um, so this yeah, this is eighty seven. Um, and Phil Bancroft again, um, a field goal with about four minutes to go this time, and, and we won. So, 
Yeah, first wasn't, season. Wasn't right on the heater. You've got a premiership under your belt. Yeah, no, it's it pretty uh, amazing. It's pretty good. It's yeah. pretty good. And once again, it's uh, it's about the people in the club. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. Just I just like seeing those people happy. Yeah. Because I knew how much they put into the play. So they're the uh, ones in the background years. that don't get the accolades. Exactly. It's the exactly. players and the yeah, coach generally. Yeah, it's yeah. like they're doing well, they yeah. get all the glory, and then there's just so much going on in the yeah. background to keep a club alive, you know. Yeah, exactly. Now, I have one quick question that you mentioned when Brendan Tutor came over and he, with transfers and stuff. Did clubs have to release players? Were yeah. they contracted or anything like that for clubs? Like I don't know how Oh, there was. I mean, right through that uh, era of Canterbury Rugby League, uh, you know, I would say from probably uh, early 80s um, through to, oh, I'm not sure when it finished, but somewhere around about the 90s, um, there was there was some money about, you know, okay. for whatever reason. Um, how much? I mean, I'll be able to touch on some when we move on a bit further, but yeah, um, yeah there, there was a bit of money around. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the players were contracted as such, and he was one well, of those because he was a top. Well, I'm not player. sure what Brendan got at, um, okay. at Hornby. I wouldn't know. Um, but he did need a release yeah, as such. Well, there was a there's a transfer system where you you could only you could only take uh, you could only get so many players in a year. Like, oh, okay. Uh, it was two in or two out or something like right. that, you know. Right. Um, like from other clubs. Yeah, yeah, from clubs. So it was just so one club didn't go and absolutely yeah. one that were pillage. Rich, rich some, clubs. Yeah. R- you know, pillage robbing from clubs, the poor clubs. Yeah, you know, yeah. So to try and yeah, so it was it was more that scenario that that I thought he wasn't going to get it than, yeah. than anything to do with money or anything like yeah. that at that stage. So I guess if a player wants to go and their heart's not in it, I guess a coach maybe might that's, be willing to let him go. Maybe that's what they yeah. they thought, but I. You know, being Hornby and being Horsell, I didn't think yeah, that pretty, they were pretty be, big. Well, enemy, yeah, big no, enemy. Was, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, through this period here in uh, '84, uh, through here while I'm coaching, I'm living about uh, two or three hundred metres from the Hornby club rooms. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so so I used to get. Off, uh, well, yeah. no, I used to get. I used to get. Uh, oh. I got on well with a uh, uh, Hornby stalwart, Keith Burgess. He, right. had a, he had the motor mechanic shop around the corner, and yeah. um, uh, I used to get mem- memorabilia um, left on the letterbox and on the front lawn and whatever. But, <laughs> I'd be like, uh, sweet, I put it on training. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, um, that, that's why I, I say about um, this um, Horsehall Hornby thing, you know, yeah. it's um, it was a bit of a shame in 84 when it got a bit spiteful oh, really? um, because it was. It was really, um, it was really in good taste, you know. Mm. Um, it should be too, like friendly yeah. rivalry. Like yeah, the rivalry is yeah, great, yeah. but I you mean, want it uh, to. I mean, '85, um, just wheeling it back a bit. I mean, uh, that year they had they had six internationals in, wow. in their side, you know, uh, the the side we beat. So we probably had no no right to win the game, but but we did. But you, you did. Know, yeah. So let me ask then, what was your style of coaching? that brought the team together and to get them to buy into what you wanted? Like, what is it that you think you did as a coach? What was your style? Oh, I probably communicated. Um, Yeah, yeah, I I don't know really. I um, I still can't work it out. But I'm not saying, you know, you're not, you don't win every game, you know. Um, And getting back to, we'll probably touch on it when we talk about um, 88, um, Getting back to it, you're not going to win every game, and it took me a while to understand that. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we used to lose games, and you just because you were coaching and that you you just couldn't get over it, you know. Right. But you had to. Yeah. Um, and it, it took me a while to understand that side of it. Okay. Um, but as, as, talking about style, I I don't know. It was not inhibiting people. Okay. Um, They've got and, natural abilities yeah, yeah, that are unique. Let yeah, them use it. Yeah. Just pretty much setting points and getting the ball there and, okay. and letting letting the ball do the rest. And Absolute fundamentals. The, and yeah. the ability of the players that you already had, yes. along with the techniques that you refined and mm-hmm. all the rest of it, um, okay. took care of the rest of it. All right, so you mentioned 88. You went back-to-back grand finals. Yep. Pretty handy start to your coaching career. Yeah, mate. That's <laughs> what I say. Um, yeah, so 88 um, was pretty much the same. The, 
uh, so we'd lost Phil Bancroft. He'd gone. Um, he'd gone to Glenora in Auckland. Yes. Um, At the Glenora and, Bears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A fella called Graham Carden come down and um, obviously, 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 oh, <coughs> sorry, obviously offered him money, and uh, he went rightfully so. Um, and we were only uh, a few games into the into the year, and we lost Brendan. He done a, a medial ligament. Okay. I think. I think it's medieval. There's one you can play, you can still play, but yeah, yeah and there's one that you, I think it's ACL. ACLs, you're just gone. So that's what he had, and uh, so he had the option of uh, surgery or just building uh, building the muscle up around yep. the knee. So he took the option of um, of building uh, building the muscle up. I mean, if he had the operation, he would have been out all oh, year. Um, months, yeah. Our hope was that he would... He would do the the rehab, which he did, mm -hmm. and maybe if we were lucky and we were in a position, we'd get him back at the end of the year. Right. So, um, yeah, I can't I can't remember too much as far as the step by step through the year, but we obviously uh, we obviously won the competition, I think, because we played for the Thacker Shield. Mm -hmm. um, but then I think they changed it from competition winner to the grand final winner. Okay. Um, so anyway, we get through and we we through the semi finals and Brendan still hadn't played. Um, so it was a matter of one more game. Um, yeah. So was he was he going to play? Um, between himself and myself, we we knew that he was going to. Okay. Um, but we went. Obviously, saying too much. We were we were down uh, Maris. We were playing Maris in the final. Then, oh really? Uh, Jared Stokes was coaching them. Then um, he he was a player coach. Um, they had Wayne Wallace by then and Logan oh, Edwards. Um, handy players. Yeah, so wow. they had a good side. Uh, yeah. Maris and I just thought that, um, and I'm not sure whether we. I think we'd lost to them during the competition one game. Mm -hmm. um, and I just knew that if we could get Brendan on the field, that our blokes would grow another yeah. couple of inches. Yeah. You know? um, and so that's uh, so he made he made his appearance, he, and he he certainly he certainly won the passenger that oh, day. That's awesome. um, and we uh, we won another final. So that's crazy. That's two. Yeah. Mate, two from two. How good yeah, is that? No, it was pretty good. Um, but it's it's not about. You know, it wasn't about me. It was uh, it was about it's the whole everybody team involved. It's about yeah. it was it was the whole club really. Yeah. And I mean, um, rugby league in Canterbury is going gangbusters at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so it was yeah, it was it was pretty special. Yeah. So at eighty eighty six, I decided I yeah I don't know why I I suppose I thought well I know I thought I didn't want to be because we'd won two finals and. I didn't want to be the bloke that wasn't going to win one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I'd already decided that um, that I was only going to coach those two years. Okay. And pretty much a lot of coaches um, through that 70s, 80s era only ever coached the club side for two or three years max mm -hmm. anyway. You know, um, there was always, and I don't think it was right, but and I never, but I didn't think that at the time. There was a there was a saying, you know, that people get familiar with you and all the rest of it. But for me, um, I, I'd managed to win two grand finals, and I didn't want to be the bloke that wasn't going to win one. Okay. Um, well, you yeah, certainly so, did that two grand. So finals. I wasn't um, <clears throat> I wasn't going to coach Horsell, um, and I wasn't going to coach at all really because we okay. had a second child. Um, my wife was working part time at night. And I was obviously working and was getting the kids, um, getting the kids looked after while, yep. you know. Just busy, um, busy. So I wasn't, yeah. Yeah. So I wasn't going to do it. But. Okay. So let's talk a bit more about you as a coach. Like um, when you're in, you're coaching a team, did you have to treat certain players differently according to their personalities, religion or culture or was, did you treat players differently as a coach or were you just like one rule suits all yeah well i've heard plenty of people say one rule suits all yeah i don't think i certainly don't agree with that okay because it doesn't you know um rightly or wrongly there's uh there's different standards for different people and it's not outwardly you know mm -hmm. like outwardly it's as though everybody's on the on the same level uh -huh. but you do know 
um, you're dealing with a team, so there's a whole lot of different personalities. Very much. Um, there's a whole lot of different egos. Yep. <laughs> um, and, you know, you've just got to work your way through it. Did you find, say, someone with a, a large ego, is, is it more that you want to temper it or do you want to, like, let them go for gold? Like, w- what's the balance? Yeah, well, you've got to work that out on the personality, don't you? You <laughs> yeah. know, there's certainly blokes that you can let go and there's plenty, plenty of blokes that you've got to tell them to pull their head in. Um, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. that's happened. Uh, yeah, on quite a few occasions. Yeah, and you were quite happy doing that uh, oh, with mate, your team. If somebody, if somebody's getting ahead of themselves, yep. then um, that's no good for them. It's no good for the team, and it's no. no good for me. Did you ever struggle with having to like deliver bad news or dropping players or things like that? Was that? Yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah always. Yeah. Because um, well, it's, it's not a matter of struggling. You know, you're going to tell them, um, but you see the effort they're putting in, and. Yep. Um, and you, there's only one place they want to be, and that's on the field, you know. Yeah. And whether they're going from the bench to out of the team altogether, or whether they're going from the team to the bench, or yeah, um, yeah it's, it's yeah, you know, you know that it's yeah. not what they want to hear. Yeah. Um. So it's uh, it's not a matter of you know, you're not scared to deliver it because you know it's not going to happen. Okay. And I didn't always <clears throat> try and hang off, but there's occasions when, um. You might tell somebody early on, yep, and then next minute somebody's injured at, at training, and then they're, and back. they're back in, <laughs> and, and you never had to put them in that space, you know. Right. Um, so, yeah, depending on who it was, um, you might leave it till after the last training, okay. um, or towards the end of the last yeah. training, and say, "Well, mate, um, unfortunately, you're not playing, or you're on the bench." Or, mm-hmm. but I mean, I suppose. You're a coach because, and you, you don't, you don't think this um, yourself, but I suppose you can read those sort of things. Okay. You know, who who can handle it? Who can't? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I'd be way too. Well, I'd have way too much empathy to be a coach because I'd oh. I'd feel for the person too much. So I'd be the wrong sort of person. <laughs> but yeah. some people have no problems, like say being a manager or like just telling people straight. You know, I, I you know I guess that's not my way. Yeah. But yeah. So that's why I love asking that question. <laughs> um, so what are some of your non-negotiables as a coach with your players and demands and standards? Oh, it's just, I don't, non-negotiables as such, um, you know, it's just setting a standard where people want to be part of it, you mm-hmm. know, and they want to they wanna be there. Um, I mean, there's, there's players that you've stood aside or whatever because they haven't turned up for training or been late for training or mm-hmm. whatever, but... Um, yeah, I think first and foremost, it's it's the environment that they they want to be there. Yep. Um, so they are there, um, and you don't have too many problems. I mean, That's if good. there's always emergencies going to crop up. Uh-huh. Isn't there? I mean, as long as they communicate. Um, I mean, back in the early days, there wasn't cell phones or anything. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> somebody rock up to training and. Uh, you know, the wife's praying the car or whatever, you know, you just got to accept those sort of things. Yeah, yep. but I guess that's when it comes down to reputation. If your reputation's pretty solid, then you're more likely going to accept whatever reason. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, it's... Rugby league people are very similar. Yeah. They, it's they just, are, they, they? They come out of a mould, you know. Some are a bit louder than others and some show off a bit more. And But, you know, run of the mill, they're... They are pretty similar, you know. Pretty it's working people. class, um, and I love this part about it. It's a working class game, yeah. and um, you know the people they pay their they pay their pittance, and they they come from tough beginnings. A lot of them, a lot of them, mate. You know. And um, you know, it's uh, it's their day out. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, so, what's the dream player to coach? Like, what's the player that if you could have him in a certain way, what would be that perfect player? Oh, I've, I've coached plenty of those sort of blokes. Yeah. Um, just blokes that work hard, um, train hard, um, yeah, just go to the end. Um, yeah. And pretty much that's been um, that, that's been the message, you know, um, preparing teams that are going to be there in the 80th minute. And to yeah. do that, you've got to work hard and you've got to, you got to buy in. You got to be there for your mates, and you know because it's uh, it's a team game, and yeah, um, pretty much that's it, really. Uh, Perfect. Uh, 
yeah, I suppose uh, every coach likes a tough bloke, but you know, yeah, they've got to be, they've got to be tough. They've got to be mentally tough, and they've got to be, they've got to work hard. Yep. Awesome. So in '89, you switched to Linwood as coach. How did you approach things going into a new club? Like, do you just go in and say, "This is the way we're doing things," or do you feel things out a little bit first? This uh, this was um, this was a test. This one. Um, okay. And the re- the only reason I really took it on um, was um, I went to with a mate of mine. I went to the '88 World Cup final at Eden Park. And uh, on a in a group, and um, up there, and we we're having a few beers. Obviously, we we're up there for the weekend. We we're having a few beers in the pub, and I come across a bloke called uh, named Russell Ward. Okay, and uh, always had a lot of respect for Russell. Russell used to coach Limwood back in the days. Yep, um, he, he coached um, uh, Paul Truscott, Cliff Lenny. Uh, Lou Hudson, they had they had a good team, and one thing I admired about the side that he coached, I think he was co- he did coach them when, when I started playing Premier Football, but I remember watching them before that and the way they defended, like they were before their time, like they would just race off the line, and, yeah. you know. Um, I don't know that they won a final or anything like that, but they all they were always there or thereabouts. Right. So I um, I certainly admired the way he coached. Um, I like the bloke as a man. He's mm-hmm. uh, he's a pretty straight shooter. Yep. Um, so I having a beer, and Russell said to me, um, uh, "You're not coaching next year." And I said, "No, I'm not." And he said, uh, "Would you think about coaching Linwood?" And I said, oh, "Well, how does that work?" Because the previous year, uh, Linwood were about to be relegated. Oh, geez. Um, and through through a couple of uh, loopholes uh, for the grading round. Um, if they had lost the grading round, they were they were going down. Um, they recruited Mark Broadhurst and a couple of other players. And mm-hmm. I can't remember who the others were. And a couple of the recently retired Linwood blokes, and I'm not sure, I think Paul Truscott might have been one of them. Um, they come back and they, they got them through it. Right. So um, they decided that that was rock bottom for the club and they were going to um, obviously find a coach. They were going to spend some money, mm-hmm. um, and they were going to uh, build a team. Fortunately for them, they did have a, they had a nineteen year old team um, with a nucleus of like Horswell had had yeah. previous Decent uh, players. Nucle- uh, nucleus of uh, good players. Michael Brown was a junior Kiwi hooker, and oh, nice. um, there was a whole lot of other blokes that had played in the nineteen year old Canterbury team. So they had the nuclear. So he, he said to me, uh, would, you, would you consider it? And I said, oh, I'll have a think about Russ. So I got back and he must have made contact again. He, um, he said, well, do you want to come to a meeting? So I went to a meeting at uh, car sales down Manchester Street, a fellow Bruce Kane yep. run the car sales. And there was a few Linwood identities there. And yep. we had a chat and decided... Um, there was going to be some money in money in it for me. That's nice. um, it wasn't sole purpose, but they were going to spend some money and they were going to buy some players. Um, okay. So I thought oh, this this will be cool, you know, to um, not do the negotiation with the players, but build a team that was yeah. going to um, do something and hopefully get their club yeah. back up where they wanted it to be. So. Yeah. Decided that was going to be uh, part of the journey, um, and then it just went on from there. And um, so we we mapped out what sort of players we wanted, um, who we wanted, and initially um, it was only going to be two or three um, players, and they were going to come from Auckland. Oh wow! Um, so the players that we we were going to go for were George Mann. Mm-hmm. Um, and either Tia or Ivor Ray Party. Oh, stop it! So yeah. the 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 thing was, uh, so myself and another uh, bloke from the the committee or the the board at Linwood, um, Laurie Knight, we went to Auckland and made made arrangements, obviously, to to meet with these blokes mm-hmm. um, through uh, Rex Dowzell, who was. Uh, an ex Linwood man played for Canterbury, um, who was living up there. Um, so Rex picked us up, and we uh, we had meetings with George, with George Mann and 
the, the row parties. Um, yep. They were keen. Oh, cool. There was, uh, and they were they were keen on the on the money. That wasn't, you know. Um, but there was one sticking point, and we knew this from the start. They <clears throat> all three of them had been on the rookie scheme the year before. Yes, over to Australia. Yeah, yeah. And part of the rookie scheme was that they had to come. <clears throat> sorry, they had to come back, and they had to play for the club that they had played for beforehand. Right. So that in essence, they were coming back and they were repaying that club for the year that they'd been away. Okay. So we thought that uh, New Zealand Rugby League might have taken a bit of sympathy on the club because yeah. we were trying to build Canterbury Rugby League and all the rest of it. But no, that wasn't going to be the case. So oh, no. um, that was after those meetings, that was never going to happen. So okay. uh, then we had to decide again what we were going to do and um, how we were going to um, put this team together. So we decided to spread the... The money a bit wider okay and um through uh talking to people like um bob bailey and that in auckland um we got on to some of the up-and-coming players um so there was a there was a bloke um daryl hanari who, okay. who uh, was playing at mount albert on the wing and had played for new zealand maoris and he's uh he was the builder of the wingers that we got running around today, whereas, yeah. you know, a lot of wingers back then were yeah. a bit smaller. Yep. So we went for Daryl Hanari, uh, Carl Hall, who was in the junior Kiwis, yep. and um, he was a uh, an outside back, maybe a 5'8 at a pinch, so we were going to play him at 5'8. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and around that, uh, Justin Wallace um, from from the Bay of Plenty, who yeah. just played in a Kiwi trial and uh, against Clayton Friend and had gone well. So. Nice. Um, there was another one. Um, then um, we had other people. By the by, the time the word was getting out that this was starting to happen, we had another bloke that was already down here who'd played for Mount Albert, uh, and um, Glenn Moore who was playing for Papua Newey, so he wanted to come over. Okay. Um, Russell Tudor, he had. Uh, so we needed a prop. Um, we already had one, and uh, Muku Rangi Aho who who was the glue to the team right. in the end. You yep. know, he was a little boy. Um, so um, Russell had played for Horswell in 86. So I had a chat to Russell and Russell come over. Um, and uh, then Andrew Vincent, he, uh, yeah, he was player. at Papua New Year, yeah. So he wanted to come. And so this money was getting spread out. And all of a sudden we had those five or six blokes, but, we had that nucleus as well, and then um, yeah. away we went. Um, nice. So how yeah. did you approach, yeah, going in? Um, did you say, right, this is how we're doing it? Did you feel all the players out? Like, you know, yeah. Well, first of, yeah, well, first of all, it was, if there was any trepidation, it was around um, how uh, the recently retired players, you know, blokes that I'd played against who were Limwood men through and through were going to see me as going there, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, to get a manager, somebody that was going to be able to look after you yep. and um, struck gold there. Um, I didn't even know the bloke, but um, they recommended a fellow called Noel Turner. Okay. And um, so along with Noel and Muku Rangiaho, who mm -hmm. played in the front row, um, we had a couple of soldiers that were Quite going to look after you, yeah. you know. Um, so then, once you had, you know, once you knew you had that support, um, it was a hell of a lot easier. And right. then it was just a matter of conveying to these blokes, particularly the blokes that were coming in, mm -hmm. because they'd all, I mean, some of these blokes uh, from Mount Elda played under Mike McLennan. And, right. You yeah. Know, so they knew what a good coach looked like. And I'm not saying, I, I wasn't Mike McLennan, um, but it was getting them to a stage where they knew that they could rely on you and, you know, what you were going to ask them to do was what they were yeah. um, used to or perceived as the right direction. Right. So it was just a matter of saying, well, boys, this is what we're about. Uh, yep. We don't want to inhibit anybody. This is how we want to play the game, but we've just got to turn up. We're going to work hard. We're going to train hard, and 
the results should come. And the results should come, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, very nice. I coached Linwood in 89 and 90. So in 90, um, the start of that year or the off-season, um, a bloke I played with at Horsell, Daryl Hawker, he was coaching Rickerton. And he rang me up and they had, uh, you know, this all, uh, everybody will know, no, this bloke, well, Quinton Pongi was playing, yeah. and he'd just played in the Junior Kiwis the year before. And uh, Daryl rang me up, and reckon him were only playing Premier Bs, and he said, uh, Quinton Pongi, and I said, yep. He said, you need to get him over to Linwood. Mm-hmm. Um, he said he needs to get out of reckon him because it's not... Um, can't oh, it's provi- too good can't for provide him, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And so, yeah, that happened. So we, we got Quinton Pongi. Wow. Um, and... We played in the, I think we played a pre-season competition and then the first premiership came, come around and wow. Quinton got sent off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he only missed a couple of weeks, but that was the start of, you know, so that was the start of his career. At Linwood, yeah, under yeah. yourself. Well, you, wow. you know, yeah, well, whoever the coach was, he was yeah. going to, he would have been there, but. Um, yep. Awesome. So yeah, so you did go on to coaching the South Island team and you took on the Roosters. Oh, this, yeah, this was um, 1992. Yes. Uh, yeah, 1992. So there was a, there was a game organised uh, for a South Island invitation team um, to play, uh, yeah, to play, well, it was Eastern Suburbs back in yep. those days, um, uh, in a pre-season game. So um, this was arranged by the Addington Club and a bloke called uh, Arnie Turnbull, mm-hmm. along with... Um, a fellow, I forget his first name, but McManus was his surname. Okay. Uh, and he was uh, tied up with Mobile Oil, so they were going to underwrite the game. Okay. Um, so they, uh, yeah, they they laid it on. They gave us the, the opportunity to select a, a South Island team, but predominantly come out of Canterbury with yeah. um, with Chris Neem, who was playing for Horswell then um, as, a, as a coaster. Um uh, Brent Stewart, uh, oh, so he, nice. he he was playing for Eddington. He captained the team, yep. um, and then it was pretty much uh, it wasn't the exact Canterbury representative team because there was other blokes that um, that we gave a go that yep. you know weren't in the Canterbury team, but you know we we liked the look of and yep. um, yeah. So yep, we along with uh, John Davey, who was uh, the Canterbury physio at that stage and was into um, strength and conditioning and the rest of it. So we had a, we started training about the uh, start of November and trained right through the summer at, yeah. at Rugby League Park. And um, I mean, I'm not sure of the date, but uh, it was Hugh McGann's last, last game of Rugby League, oh, yeah. uh, wow. that one, and Gary Freeman was playing for the Roosters. So he had... Uh, True. Mark Murray was coaching them. Yep. And Jack Gibson, he was uh, he was a coaching advisor or whatever. He, he was here with them, and um, so they they had a pretty good team. Craig Salvatore and yep. uh, Luke Rickerson. I think he was just kicking up, kicking off. Yeah, then. he was um, a gun. Yeah, far out. So pretty cool experience. Did you guys do well in that match? I, I can't. Yeah, remember the no. Score. Well, the score was about twenty-seven six or something. So okay. you know, by that standard, I mean none of our. None of the players here had uh, had experienced NRL or, no. or even reserve grade or anything like that. Um, so yeah, but it's probably, didn't disgrace yourselves no, at all. No, no. Yeah. Chris Neem scored the only try, and um, oh, well, yeah. well done. Yeah. Um, so just to change tack a little, like, how did you feel the differences in the media in terms of exposure for the game in Canterbury back then as opposed to now? Yeah, well, when you're when you're involved, I mean. Like I said before, um, and as rugby league, I mean, in the 60s and 70s, was probably doing fine in, in, in Christchurch, but I didn't really click on until, you know, the, the, the mid-70s through that, uh, through the mid-70s, 80s and into the 90s. Um, but we had, um, there was one person that stood out above everybody, really, it was uh, John Coffey, who was... Um, a journalist for the press Mm -hmm. and um, I know it might have been his job and he was being paid for it but uh, he got rugby league uh, front 
centre and back yeah. of, uh, of the sports pages whenever he could. Um, Amazing. And he done a he done a tremendous job, John. And he's a rugby league man from the west coast mm-hmm. who obviously shifted to Christchurch, looking for a for a uh, for a job at the press yeah. and whatever got it. And um, yeah, he certainly uh, he certainly done the green proud. He just at every opportunity. He put the game out there and yeah. um, put it in people's faces, and um, yeah. the great, uh, as I say once again, it might have been his occupation, but um, he deserves a medal for what he did. Well, in a city that's just rugby union mad, yeah, yeah, it's pretty impressive yeah. because he just—it still doesn't get the same press now, yeah. you know. Well, uh, you know, through that through that period in the uh, in the eighties, uh, mid eighties, and that. Um, we we would play Hornby. Horsel would play Hornby on a Wednesday night at the showgrounds, and you get three or four three or four thousand people there. You play yeah. them in a grand final, and you get nine or ten thousand people wow. there. You know, it was um, still a decent crowd. Too. The, pre, the pre-game <laughs> entertainment's a helicopter landing. You know, for club <laughs> football, it's uh, yeah, yeah. it was just. Yeah, so good. That's so good, man. So you had more success with Horsel coming back. Winning another grand final in 1995. How'd you come back to Horsville? How'd I come back to Horsville? You're the prodigal uh, son, mate. No, <laughs> you just keep yeah, coming well, back. Yeah, well, 93, uh, I was just floating around the club, wasn't coaching. Uh, Jared Stokes was actually coaching the premier team in 93 at Horsville. Um, so I was just floating around and uh, a bloke, another bloke that I've got a lot of respect for, Danny Edmonds, um, he... He had a son, um, Jared Lawrence, that was playing in a 17-year-old team. And um, so he come and asked me, he said, uh, would I coach this team? Because I didn't have a coach. So okay. I thought, yeah, why not? Um, and in this team were three or four good footballers. Yep. There was uh, three or four wayward kids um, yeah. that in the end went down the wrong track. But so... Um, yeah, I coached that team, no success, but once again, just probably more as a mentoring type thing, okay. really, you know, yep. um, trying to turn youth into good people. Yes, um, that's part of the job. Yeah, well, it works yeah. with some, and you, you <laughs> yeah. have some success and you have some failures. Yep. I had some failures with there, but um, so I did that for two years, I, must, I think it was two years, mm-hmm. so, and then um, Jared coached the premiers in 93 and then they got another coach in 94 and at the end of 94 they they hadn't performed well so they were moving this coach on and so i applied for the uh for the coaching job um i thought i was i thought i was a shoe in yeah <laughs> um <laughs> anyway i missed out um oh well uh so what had happened is uh they gave it to this other bloke because they probably thought they were getting two for one. They were going to get a player coach. Um, right. And that's all right, but he had no coaching credentials or anything like that. So when I applied, um, because, um, you know, I'd been back and forward, yeah. I had an idea that maybe, you know, there was somebody that wanted to square up. But yeah. um, <laughs> So I never got it. And the president at the time uh, wasn't, Ridge Wakefield, but he, the president rang me and he told me uh, that I hadn't got the job and I was gutted, to be honest. Okay. Um, but I made up my mind that if I didn't get it, I wasn't going to throw my toys out of the cot. I'd just carry on coaching these yep. kids and mm-hmm. see if we could make a difference. So um, so just after Christmas, 95, uh, obviously that coach is preparing them and then something happened and he couldn't fulfil his obligations. Yeah. Um, so the phone rang, yeah. um, but it wasn't the president that told me I never had the job. It was, uh, it was the manager of the team. <laughs> he said, uh, would you come and coach them? And I said, yeah, well, that's no brainer. Yep. Um, because it was a good team. But at, at that time also, that started the Lion Red Cup. Yes. Um, so there was two teams in Christchurch, the Shiners and the Cardinals. Okay. And Horswell were aligned to the Cardinals. So they lost a lot of uh, good players there. Mm-hmm. Um, well, obviously, your leading players are going to be in the Cardinal side if they're available. Yes. Um, if they want to play. Um, but we still had a good team um, yep. and had a successful year. Nice. Um, yeah. yeah. So, Winning another grand final. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was good. Uh, That's amazing. It was good. Yeah, I really... Probably of the three I won at Horsell, um, they're all good, 
but because you'd had the rug pulled from under you to start off with, yeah, and to come back and win it, um, it's pretty sweet. It was, was pretty good. Yeah. So you became the assistant coach of the Canterbury Bulls um, for the inaugural, the inaugural Bard Card Cup, and you went all the way being premiers. So how were you selected? What was the process of becoming an assistant coach with the Bulls? Well, I'd coached Horsell from 95 through, and I think the last year was 98. Yeah, so 99 I was I didn't do anything. And for me, for all intents and purposes, that was it. Um, but in this life, you've always got to have somebody in your corner. Yes. Um, and Jeff Whitaker, he was uh, he was a horsehall boy. I, I'd coached and played with it, played yep. in the same team as him. But he at that stage he was a development officer for Canterbury Rugby League. Um, and Jared Stokes was obviously going to be the the head coach of the Canterbury Bulls for that for that year yeah. um, or for the foreseeable future. And he, I think, although I got on well with Jared, I'd, I'd played for Maris with Jared and yeah. um, he'd coached Horswell and I'd had numerous, you know, numerous beers with the bloke. Yep. Um, I didn't really think about uh, an assistant coach's job, but so Jeff, Jeff rang me and asked me if I'd be interested. Okay. Um, so obviously Jared, had, he wouldn't have done that without talking to Jared. Yep. So then it, they kicked that off and away we went. Yeah. Nice. So so what were some of the trials and tribulations of that season on your way to being premiers? I was really, um, in the in the early stages of the Barter Card Cup on, on a weekly basis, it was um, obviously playing at home was, uh, well, to wheel it back a wee bit, I had very little to do with the organisational, okay. the early organisational side of it. So Jared obviously done that. He had the strength and conditioning and all that uh, organised, and um, that was pretty much well underway before I um, got into the into the organisation. Um, but then it come down to the travel and um, you know uh, that type of thing, and getting making arrangements to make it as normal as as it could be. Right. Um, so there's a fit, bit of trial and error. Yep. Um, but we obviously um, got ahead of that. I, I should say that um, at the start of that year, 2000, year 2000, and I'm not sure, uh, probably was late 99, that um, a bloke come on board um, the Canterbury Rugby League, Marcus Durkin. Okay. Um, he was uh, from the north of England, um, Bradford. Right. Um, mad rugby league man. Yeah. He'd taken over, um, well, CEO, or he was running Canterbury Rugby okay. League. And so he was all in, yep. Marcus. He wanted to make this as successful as he as it could be. Yep. Um, it wasn't a matter of um, money didn't count or anything like that. Obviously, there was budgets and he only had so much to work with. Mm -hmm. But anything he could give or get, was it was going to happen. That's um, awesome. So that certainly helps. Yeah. Um, it certainly helped Jared. And uh, Jared had created an environment that was, once again, where people worked hard, yeah. uh, trained hard, and there was um, buy-in and there was discipline. Um, yeah. And, yeah, it was successful. And it, did, it wasn't without its hiccups. I mm -hmm. mean, we got um, through the year, we performed. We had the odd game where we, we fell away. Yeah. Um, but that was now when you look back on it, it's more about the travel and it's all that. A learning so, curve of yeah, how to deal yeah, with all yeah, those exactly. hurdles. Exactly. Yeah. Um, we did uh, <laughs> we did get carved up in the in the semi final. Yeah. Uh, by the eventual team that we that we played in the final. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, on on the day, um, we got it done. Got um, the job done. Nice. When you say about Jared, like he, he was he was a great coach, Jared Stokes. Um, you know, he left, he left no stone unturned. Yeah. So as an assistant coach, what's your role in the team that's different to being a head coach? Yeah, well, I, you, do, you do a bit of mopping up. Okay. Um, but it's, the main thing is that you're, you know, you're 100% behind the bloke that's... Um, yeah, you wouldn't want to undermine the coach. No, no not at all. Yep. And um, I think, you know, there was... There was no opportunity for that because what he was delivering, as it proved in the end, yeah. we were on the right track. Well, I was I was learning too, you know, yeah. because I'd only I'd only coached 
club football, whereas Jared had been and he'd coached the Cardinals in the Lion okay. Red Cup, and so he had those he had those learnings from from that um, from his experiences there. Um, so he he was in a far better position to be a head coach of that right of that organisation at that time. I mean, we're both the same age. Um, but he was, you know, he was the better man for the job. I, you know, I didn't even apply for it. As just I say, it was just a phone call. To, fell in your lap? Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah. So you did eventually go on to take over as head coach, 2002. Yeah. Um, you guys finished in 10th place, so a rough start to being your head coach. Tell me about it. Um, I'll, tell so, some, I'll tell you some stories about this. Well, let's hear a couple. Like, So, yeah, how, how did that season go for you guys? Well, so end of 2001, Jared decided that he was he was looking for a, a professional career so um, he got offered or applied for a semi-professional or professional um, job at Wellington Rugby League yep. so uh, and they were going to they were part of Bartercard Cup anyway so he decided that he was taking that job and mm-hmm. fair enough um, Mike Godney who was on the board then he, he just rang me one night and said um because I knew Jared was going, he said, "Do you want the job?" I said, "Yes," and it was done. That was that. Um, so Jared, um, and this happens in sport. So um, he took with him uh, Lucy Sioni, uh, Taylor Palanisi, and Johnny Limmer. I've heard um, all those names through yeah. these podcasts. They're so very big names. Probably, <laughs> probably three of our better strike weapons. Yeah. Um, so he took them to Wellington. Um, a lot of the other players from 2000, 2001, um, they were coming to the end of it. And also, um, they weren't really getting any great recompense for the time. Okay. And, you know, So there'd be blokes there that had to um, give up overtime at work or whatever to yeah. make training. And mm-hmm. so they, you know, they, were, they were finding it pretty difficult. So, so I got this job and I thought, right, what now? So the first thing, um, obviously, you do is you put um, put the team around you, the management side of it. Um, so I wanted an assistant coach, and um, I was there was plenty of coaches around that you could have gone for. Yeah, you know that had coaching experience, but through my experience of probably the previous ten years or whatever, um, I'd had a I'd had a wee bit to do with Brent Stewart. Yep. I knew the character of the bloke. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously knew where he'd been and what Kiwi he'd done. Kiwi test prop, pretty yeah, handy. Um, <laughs> and so I thought, uh, why not? So I went and seen uh, went and seen Brent. Yeah. And um, just as luck would have it, um, Gary Gary Freeman had been talking to him recently because Gary was coaching the Kiwis in about coaching, you know, in and around this district. Right. Um, I think he'd mentioned the the eighteen Canterbury eighteens or something. So, so this for Brent who didn't have any coaching experience, had plenty of playing experience yep. under different coaches, but no coaching experience as such. He thought that probably the better course for him was to come with me. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So I'm very pleased he did because yep. um, his reputation, um, you know just goes before him. Um, well, that's right. Players have looked up to him, very surely. straight up and down man. And yeah. I don't know, to this day, so um, at work I run the slaughter board, he runs the stockyards. Oh, so, true. Um, you know, there's still a connection there. But, oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, so uh, my mind was that I couldn't have got a better bloke and it, and it certainly worked out that way. And for him, it was a foot in the door. It was a, a chance to not so much learn, but, you know, tread a bit of water and get a bit of coaching under his belt and then mm-hmm. when the time come right for him to be, if he wanted to be a head coach, um, I'm not saying that I was the best person to learn from, but it was an opportunity for him. I'm glad he took it. Um, yeah. Then probably the other than that assistant coach, then it was around the strength and conditioning. And by this time, um, Jeff Whitaker was actually running Canterbury Rugby League, okay. uh, in between CEOs, Marcus Durkin, had, uh, he'd moved on. Yep. Um, so we we had a, a bloke that played in the same team as us at Horswell and had gone on to 
to a sports science degree at Otago University, Malcolm Hump, right. and he was running the gym and uh, I think he was something to do with sports science at Canterbury University. Okay. So we got him, and that was a that was a major move. Yeah. Um, and that was Jeff that drove that. But okay. Hummy was a he, he's a great man. He's running the Canterbury Rugby League at the moment. Oh wow. God bless him. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that was a, that was another great move because yeah. uh, Hummy had a rapport with the players. Um, and then uh, we went with the status quo with Bertie Milne because yeah. uh, we knew we could rely on him, and mm -hmm. he had the he had the uh, he had the runs under the belt. He, as far as organising travel and all yeah. the rest of it, so it had been not that we ever thought about it, but it would have been suicidal tipping him out because yeah. he had all the he had all the um, all those all the, things in place, had all the nuts and bolts yeah. sorted. And so yeah. the you know we went through a stage where. We'd lost all these players, and um, that happens. Um, mm. But we had to get all these other young blokes conditioned. We were we were left with very the only uh, the only player we were really left with that knew what it took was Shane Byers. Right. Um, and you know you'd have Shane Byers in your corner any day of the week. Yeah. Um, so it was a matter of uh, spending some time and getting these blokes up to. Getting the strength up, the conditioning, and and the boy, and so we started in uh, November, mm -hmm. and obviously worked through and over and and into the new year. Um, certainly, what we were seeing yeah. at training, we were excited by. Yeah. Um, but um, so we come round to the competition, and our first game was a uh, was away against yeah. Wellington. Yeah. Um, I don't think it would have mattered whether we won that game but we only just lost you know okay. um would have could have should have um our second game was against um manawa two mm -hmm. down here yep. um and we won yep um so that was uh, that was a good pick me up and yeah, monkey we off were, the back yep. yeah we thought we might have been right um and then we go into an 11 week spell that was uh <laughs> Pretty barren. Pretty barren. And uh, <laughs> there's a couple of pastings amongst it. Right. But all through this time, um, we were we were trying blokes out. You know, it wasn't a matter of, you know, there was blokes getting injured also. And so there was people getting opportunities. And it was a matter of, do they, do they measure up? Can they handle this? Not so much, well, first of all, the football, mm -hmm. but the travel. How do they behave? Yep. What are they like? Because Bertie had put these systems in place whereby we were travelling the day before a game, you know. Yep. So we were taking them away. Um, we were trying to make things as normal as they, they can. Not being at the airport at six o'clock on the on a Sunday morning to fly to Auckland and yep. play at yep. Hubbard's two and yep. then back on a plane. And it's pretty unreasonable. So we were, yeah. and in doing that also, the players were spending a lot more time together mm -hmm. and. Without them realising it, they because they're all coming from different clubs and all the rest of it, they're getting a bit of a bond themselves. Yep. So a lot of that sort of stuff was was happening without them realising uh -huh. it, and without us realising it too. You right. know? So um, through Bertie, we had a lot of that thing, a lot of that stuff in place, and the boys used to crave like we'd leave here on a Friday night, five o'clock on a flight to Auckland. Yeah, we always stayed at the Mount Richmond Lodge and. Um, and Odahu, just over the road from the Odahu club rooms. Right. There'd always be a buffet with yeah. lamb and, you know, the boys used to love a Friday. Yeah, Corey Laurie, <laughs> he mentioned he loved that buffet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, and so we used to drag them out of bed on a Saturday, if we were playing, we went Friday night, Saturday morning, um, we'd um, we'd get them out of bed and we'd go over to um, Henham Park where the Odahu uh, club rooms are, yep. and we'd just have a stretching session with a bit of light ball work. They moaned about it at the start off with, but if they were home in Christchurch on a Saturday morning, three quarters of them would have been up at six o'clock at work, you know, working yeah. a Saturday morning or something, and then yeah. come and play football. So yeah. all the time we were trying to, you know, just um, evolve things and, and get them there. Right. But I should say that through this 11-week um period where we were losing the games, um, and this is the mark of a man, um, we were we were dry on front rowers, okay. um, and we had a couple that were 
pretty leading. They were leading players in the club competition here, but you got them away and they were just a handful, so we were tipping them out. Brent come to me one day and he said, um, what say I start playing again? Really? And I said, mate, I said, no, nah, that's that shan't be happening. I okay. said, you've been, you've been to the top of this game. I said, uh, you've got too much to lose. You cop yeah. an injury or whatever. Um, Leave your legacy said, intact. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> let's, let's just finish where you finished and let us take a bit more pain okay. and we'll, uh, we'll move on. So wow. we, lost those, we lost those 11 games and I can't remember who our next win was against, but there was six games to go, I think, because we played about 22 games just in a... Around Robin. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there was about six games, no, oh, five games to go or something. Well, we won four of our last five games, and one was against Odahu, who had qualified for the playoffs. Okay. So some of that stuff that we were, that we'd um, copped, yeah. was starting to come to right. fruition, and thank Christ it was. But. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so our, our last game of the year was uh, Manawa 2. Yeah. And, um, yeah, didn't, um, so it was a night game, a Saturday night, and it was going to be played in Levin. And um, so I think uh, Davy Lomax, his he he was coaching the um, he was coaching the Manawa Two team then, right. Dave. And his dad, uh, Johnny Lomax, he, yeah. he had a pub at Levin. So that's handy. We were playing at Levin. <laughs> we were staying in Palmerston North actually. So we on the bus, obviously, out to Levin. Uh, played the game, um, we won. Yep. So that was that was a nice end to the season. Yeah. But the uh, the catch point to all this is it's Saturday night, and our flight from Manua from uh, Palmerston North home is not till eight o'clock on Sunday, and right. we've just played our last game of the year. Oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> I mean, that's what Bertie was thinking anyway. Yeah. So. Uh, so once the game's over, the season's done, and um, it's back to the hotel in Levin, and had a few there, and yep. on the bus, and back to Palmerston North, and yep. so the boys have got about, I don't know, what's, what does that work out to? About twenty-four hours, yeah, about twenty-four hours of you get through a lot downtime. of beer in twenty-four yeah, hours. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> um, it was just. Well, you're just thinking damage control, really. Yep. Yeah. Um, you're all panicking. But anyway, we got we got through the night all right, and the, the accommodation we stayed at um, uh, is just around the corner from the Fitz. I don't know if you know Palmerston North and the, and the hospitality up there, but the Fitz Hotel was a student hotel. Okay. Yeah, so that opens, uh, <laughs> yeah. that opens at 11 o'clock on a Sunday. The boys have got 11 o'clock. Got to be on a bus about 7 to go to... Oh, Palmerston man. North Airport, and at the Fitz Hotel, they sell on the Sundays. They were selling crates, cork bottles for forty dollars. <laughs> so yeah, it was. Um, oh dear. But um, to their credit, everybody stayed in shape. Um, okay. They were they were worse for wear, but yeah. they stayed in shape. We we got on the plane, got home, and dispersed for the <laughs> happy days. <laughs> Bertie probably. Uh, Breathed a great sigh of relief, <laughs> but so that was uh, that was a great end to that season, yeah. and it probably was the kickstart of um, Good platform for the for, next year, two thousand and three. Because uh, you know, pretty impressive uh, <laughs> result the next year. Went all the way. Yeah, yeah. What yeah, a so, turnaround. Yeah, and so Malcolm Hum's still there doing what he's doing. Um, Jeff Whitaker's still in the background doing the organising. Birdie, everybody's um, still on board, and. Um, so, yeah, we um, we started. Uh, we think we started reasonably well, but the back end of the season is the. Th so we went from losing eleven games the year before. Yeah. So we went to winning eleven games in a row, including the grand final. Oh, you know, what so a way to finish! Uh, just with a bit of work, and and the best part about it all, it was the same blokes, yeah. same players, that were playing. The year before, so all those through. little things you put in place. Finally well, yeah, a lot of it was stuck. a lot of it was good. Um, a lot of it was good fortune, yeah, um, and some of it was good management. But I think you've got to make your own good fortune at some point. Like if you don't put the pieces in place to get the good fortune, like you've got no chance of having yeah. those results. You've yeah. got to put the work in. Yeah, you do. I mean, a premiership. It's 
you know, probably 80%, you know, hard work and then 20% luck on the day, you know. Yeah. It can go either way. Yeah. But, they're, yeah. They're pretty special. Yeah. They're pretty special. Uh, it's incredible. So you, you made the step up to the New Zealand residence. So yep. you're sort of going up a tier now, like into New Zealand representative sides. Yeah. What's that like um, going from, you know, from club to provincial to yeah. Kiwis? I mean, to be honest, you know, like... Um, Above the schoolboy stuff, um, I shit myself every time I got a job, basically. You know, <laughs> I don't well, blame you. It's just, um, it's more about not wanting to let people down. Oh, um, I agree. Uh, yeah, so it was the same. But um, as I say, through these um, New Zealand representative sides, um, I was working with Shane Cooper a lot of the time. Yep. And, um, well, he... That says, yeah, it speaks for, it speaks for speaks yeah. for itself. Great bloke, Shane. Yeah. Um, so we'd we'd pick a team. Um, probably pretty much through it all. Um, well, in two thousand and four, when I started, Shane Byers he, he'd taken up an option at Western Suburbs and yep. to try and um, crack it there. Um, so he wasn't playing, but there was a bloke um, in Auckland playing for Mount Albert, um, Steve Buckingham. So, oh, yeah. And he's, you know, a lot of experience. So he's yeah. one of the first blokes picked. And he's one of the first blokes you talk to, you yeah. know. And um, you get on the, get him on the same page as you and yeah. away you go. So, you know, it's pretty much the same, yeah. but you're just dealing the qualities a wee bit higher. Yeah. Did you um, apply for this role or is it? No. No? no. You got... Yeah, well, so what sort of uh, what sort of happened back then was um, you win a barter card, or so, okay. so Jared won the first one. So, but it's pretty much a three year uh, go. They give you the residence or New Zealand A for yep. three years, and then so unfortunately the blokes that win it the next two years probably don't get a gig if okay. you're still doing it. Right. So uh, 2003, so so Jared done uh, 2000, 2001. He must, yeah, I, I'm not sure who done, I might have been Bluey or okay. uh, John Ackland. And then, so 2003, we won it, and then they just, New Zealand Rugby League, just ask you if you, if you want the job. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and you so go. Why you go? Um, Far out. Yeah. And so you took on that role. What was that experience like? Because then you went on to New Zealand A after that. So, what's the whole experience like uh, coaching? Like, because you've got some pretty high quality players now well, you, at your disposal. Yeah, as I say, you know, like it's uh, it was the cream or the cream of the butter card cup. Yeah. Plus. Think uh, yeah, so you had some blokes that had played a few games for the Warriors as mm-hmm. well, Hami Luaki and yeah. uh, Ivan Tuanavavi. Was Simon those, Mannering? Simon Mannering played. Uh, yeah, I, I wasn't sure whether he'd debut for the Warriors then or not. He was but in he was 2005. In the system, he debuted for the Warriors. You know, so he was the year before. Okay. So he would have been in the development system. Um, uh, Frank Paul Nuasala oh, and wow. Sunny Sunny Fai and these yeah. sort of blokes. Um, yeah, uh, so you're dealing the the qualities uh, as a group. The quality's higher. You know, yeah. we had quality in the Barter Card Cup team, yep. but um, as a group, the quality's higher. And it's uh, once again just get everybody on the same page. Same and, principles you know, as possible. Uh, you, know. you just got to <laughs> yeah. You just got to do. Your, I mean, you don't go out of your way, but you don't want to be upsetting people. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, so it's not the old sledgehammer. It ain't going to work. Um, Okay. It's just a matter of caressing your way through it. Okay. And as I say, uh, I mean, when the year later, I mean, you had Steve Buckingham, Shane Byers, so you get those two blokes. Shane knows what you're up, what you, how you operate anyway, and then okay. you know it just filters out yeah. through the filters out through the team. Um, yeah. I think as long as um, you step softly and mm-hmm. just make your way in there. Okay. Um, you got yeah, the players' go respect right. pretty go easily. Right. Yeah. 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 So you had a really good win for New Zealand A over Australia A, like 48-18. Yeah. No, you that you was, had to um, be happy about that. That was two thousand six. So I mean, yeah. outside of outside of the um, the pre, uh, the grand final wins and that that night was something pretty special yeah. because that's a two thousand and six. Um, so there was uh, I think it was Tri Nations, England, Australia, mm-hmm. and. 
New Zealand. New Zealand, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they had squads of, uh, I think they were probably 23 players, okay. maybe. So they only used 17 players. And they'd, New Zealand and Australia had uh, organised this game. They'd had it the previous year. Mm -hmm. Bernie Perinara had coached the side the right. year, previous year. And they'd won the previous year. So what happened was the, the surplus from the, from the Kiwi squad dropped down into this um, New Zealand A team, oh, nice. along with... Um, the up and coming players, you know, so the Russell Packers. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, well, there was, they were all NRL players. And Sam Rapida. Sam Rapida, yeah. Sean Kenny Dow. Um, far out. Ben Roberts. Yeah. Uh, well, Lance Ohio, he jumped, he dropped down from the Kiwis yep. along with Frank Pritchard and Owen Gutenbill. Um, That's a hell yeah. of a good Rangy, lot of names. Rangy Chase yep. actually played, uh, he played hooker in that game and, that was probably, you know, Rangy, Rangy Chase in 2006. So, you know, he was just he was just getting there. And I was just yeah. watching the other day that clip on YouTube where he... Yeah, where he set unbelievable I don't skills. Know, I can't remember seeing it at the time, but I've just never seen anything like that before in my life. He was a ridiculous talent. Yeah, yeah he was. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we... Um, and Sonny... Sunny Fire player, he was on the bench mm -hmm. that night. Um, wow, God bless him. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was uh, it was really good. Um, once again, it was we it was in Melbourne, um, at Eddie Head Stadium under the roof. Uh, the Kiwis were playing Australia after us, obviously. Uh -huh. um, so you know, it was only it was just a matter of uh, getting uh, Owen Gutenbill was going to be the captain. Um, and obviously these blokes played NRL or yeah. haven't been near the place. Um, so it was only a matter of getting him and Lance Ohio, um, Ben Roberts, yep. and saying, you know, um, this is what we're about. What do you think? You yep. know, oh, yep, if we do this, do that, and away we go, you nice. know. So yeah. um, the, week, um, the week was great. And mm -hmm. one other good part about it was... Um, the New Zealand Rugby League has sent a representative with the team as well, and it was Keith Burgess, mm -hmm. um, who put a lot of time into Hornby, the arch rivals, right, right. who I had had a bit of a uh, relationship with him owning the garage around the corner and all the rest of it. And, yep. um, but he had put a lot of time into Rugby League, and he was uh, he was New Zealand rep representative with us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, even now when I see him, he tells me how how good the week was and yeah. so once again it's about people you yeah know. but um yeah the game the game went well um i think 48 18 yeah in the end it's pretty um, good, yeah, it was <laughs> no, good over australia i remember um <laughs> as you do as a coach you know i mean um i think it was about 15 minutes to go and we might have been we might have been 20 points up at that stage mm -hmm. but 20 points in a game of rugby leagues it's not a lot, you know. Still like gettable, away. Eh? Yeah. Well, you've seen it last year's grand final, yeah. you know. Uh, oh, unbelievable. Um, so um, I've sent some, some uh, um, instructions down, and there was about 10 minutes to go, and um, Owen said to the, Owen Gutenbill said to the trainer, tell him not to worry about it, we're just going to have some fun. So they yeah. rattled on another, <laughs> they rattled on about another 10 or 12 points. They must have known they had them yeah, yeah, fairly yeah, beat. Yeah. I mean, it was a good, it was a good Australian side. There was the Morris twins, and, oh, wow. um, Jared Hayne, and, wow. um, you know, so there was a leftovers. Plus they were um, Antonio Cafusi and yeah. uh, Ben Hornby. And Jeez, so, yeah, it was, it was really enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like, because cause some people might think, oh, it's only Australia A, but when you actually rattle off the list of players that yeah. were in those sides, you'd probably on paper, Australia are always stronger. Yeah. And yeah. To, to, like you're just saying, Jared Hayne, like he was like the best player in the game for yeah, a period well, of time. Yeah, that was 2006. He was probably in his prime in 2009. That's right. Yeah, he was Dally M, I think, that year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. So you go one more level up. It comes to 2007. It's down to you or Gary Kimball for the Kiwis job. Yep. Um, talk us through uh, what that was like, um, being up at that level and even being considered for the position. What was going through your mind? Yeah, well, it wasn't something I ever thought about, to be honest. Um, yeah, uh, I'm not sure. I must have applied um, because I, yeah, I must have applied for it. Um, and then... Um, 
so it looked as though so I went to a uh, to an interview so there was a there was a panel uh, it was Frank Endicott, Howie Tamity, uh Graham Lowe pretty big fish yeah, yeah. Um, so when I went Graham Lowe was crook so they had uh, Andrew Chalmers who was okay. a, a president or whatever, a CEO or whatever so he took his place so I went up there and the interview, I thought it went all right. Yep. Um, yeah. Um, so I thought, oh, well, I've, I've had an interview. And then we got a phone call from Graham Lowe and he said, um, I, um, I, missed, I missed the interview the other day. Um, he said, can we fly you back to Auckland and really? I'll, I'll spend a day with you, you know. And okay. I thought, yeah, okay. So I went up there and Graham picked me up from the airport and we went around about, I don't know how many coffee shops. <laughs> but we had a few coffees. Um, it, filled, it filled the day in. we just yep. talk rugby league and, you know, it was just, um, it, there's a lot of people got an opinion on Graham Lowe, but yep. I think he's a great man. Right. You know? um, and so we, we filled that day in and he dropped me off back at the airport. Thanks very much mm -hmm. and away you go. Um, so th that's where it was at at that stage. Um, I was obviously working at the meatworks and getting up early in the morning. So uh, as you do, you go to, you go to bed. And there was a there was a rugby league show on Sky, um, and Steve McIver yeah. was the comp here. So this was after these meetings, and this show come on, and I don't know if my, I don't think my wife was watching it, but um, anyway, Steve McIver he thought he had the he thought he had the breaking news that. Um, so he, he spurts it out that Phil Prescott's going to be announced tomorrow as the oh, next Kiwi coach. And you happen to see this? I didn't, yeah. I, <laughs> so the phone starts going nuts. Oh, no. You know? oh no. And I didn't know anything about it. So, and then the next day he comes and um, it's Gary Kimball. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, I, oh. I didn't, uh, I wasn't taking his word for it, you know, like the media had thought that it had come down to between me and James. Um, okay. But, you know, that wasn't obviously the case. So um, then they offered me assistant coach's job along with uh, James. Okay. And to me, um, it was a no-brainer. Yeah. You, you, so take you, were, it, you take it. You were happy to be assistant even though you missed out on the top job? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, somebody says to you, at that stage, somebody says to you, um, you're going to be assistant coach of the Kiwis and you're going to... England and France. Yeah, you're an idiot if you say, "Oh, I'm." And you're, I'm just, you're somebody. Yeah. Um, you're somebody that has been uh, not passionate, but somebody that has really wanted to be involved in rugby league, yeah. and you have been all your life, well, basically. You up the way until then, it. yeah. Um, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna take it. So, yep. yeah, that was it was a no brainer. So very pleased at this point. Yeah. So you go on the All Golds tour. Yeah, they were uh, they were part of it. The first part, so yep. we um, the Kiwis and the All Gold or the players that were making up the All Golds team, because you remember that Stacey and Ruben Wickey and Nigel Wagner they'd they'd retired from international football uh, the year before. They had to, so they were going over, um, and another would have, could have, should have. There was about, um, along with those three that had retired, who were never going to be picked anyway. As far as the Kiwi team went, there was about another 10, Sonny Bill Williams, Benji Marshall, um, mm. that were injured, you know, yeah. about another 10 that were established Kiwis yeah. who who couldn't make the yeah. couldn't make the tour. Um, and along with Steve Maddai, who was only going to ever play the first test against mm. Australia and then was going home okay. for an operation. Um yeah, so that's that's where that was. Right. That's where that was at. And before that, actually, um, were you and Gary Kimball coaching the the Kiwi side against Australia in Wellington? We did. Yep. The fifty eight nil drubbing. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Do you mind if I ask you yeah, what, no, yeah, how that sure. all went down? Yeah, because for sure. yeah, I know there was a lot of uproar about that. Yeah, it didn't go down great. No. But um, yeah, you know, I've got a, <laughs> I've got a side to it too. You know, like yep. everybody, Let's hear it. yeah, everybody cops a. For whatever reason, you know, the, the preparation's the preparation and, and we're into the game. So we, um, we kick off and 
part of the preparation was I mean, a bloke Luke Cavell who was playing on it's the wing. He's the winger. Was his de- Shark's de- winger. Yeah. Um, unfortunately for Luke, he never seen the game out. He dislocated his elbow. But right. during the preparation, obviously kicking practice and that, Luke would be kicking kicking the ball off from the halfway, and he was kicking it straight down the field at the goalpost. You know. Right. So the idea was that the posts are either an obstruction to somebody trying to catch it okay. or else it's going to hit the goalposts and yeah, it could go anywhere. Yeah. So that's what happened. We kicked off. The ball could go anywhere. And it went into the arms of Jeremy Smith. Yep. Who got pulled up inches from the, from the goal line. So yeah. would have, could have, yeah. should have. And then we move on to about... Halfway through the second half, and we were down by about 12 points, 14 points, uh-huh. and under the pump. Um, but we had them at their end of the field, Yeah. and Steve Steve Maddai, um, and rightfully so, he was trying to change things for us. Yeah. So he come off the line, and Mark Gasnia was hitting the ball up, yeah. and he absolutely snot. Well, he didn't snot him as such, but the tackle rode up, and yeah. it... it um, yeah, well, it finished Mark Gasnia. It collected him pretty good. Yeah, it finished him. And yep. Steve got sent off well, you know, other than um, Adrian Morley and the, and the Pommy test. Um, yeah. Who gets sent off, you know? It's um, not often in a test match. Yeah. And so we played we played that game with, the, with all due respect, with a team that was um, a team of rookies yeah. against Australia, and we played for 60... Oh, about 60 minutes with 12, 12 players. Yeah. We also lost a winger. You might say that's not a big deal, but it changes everything else yeah. as far as the defensive structure goes. And we got pasted. Um, yeah. And, I, you know, um, a lot of these blokes were, were new to, to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and... You know, yeah, it, was, I guess it was what it was. We don't have that same depth that Australia's always had. For they, they lose a, a superstar. They literally replace them with another superstar. Whereas I don't think we have that luxury in New Zealand, especially at that time. Well, we didn't you know. at that time, but um, what what was uh, that team that went on that tour? I mean, you could, in 2008, they go and do what they, they did. Unbelievable. A, a year later. But a lot of those players had already played four or five tests by then. You know, the Sam Perrots and those type of yeah, things, you yeah. know. Um, so where did they get where did they get that experience? You know, well, how was it gonna so. start, you know? Yeah. Um gotta start somewhere. And unfortunately for them, um, we didn't have those experienced players, didn't have a Ruben Wiki, didn't have Stacey no. Jones, didn't have a Nigel Wagner. We're talking the biggest um, names in New Zealand rugby league, you know. They didn't have they didn't have any help, you know. No. Um Yes. But, um, yeah, that was... A, she was yeah, a rough old day. Yeah, well, that was the, <laughs> yeah, the, the Wellington. And, uh, yeah, the Wellington uh, yeah. was rough, but yeah. it is what it is. It is what it is. I guess there's always learnings to take from it. Yeah, yeah, for know? sure. Okay, so you took off on the All Golds Tour. You had three matches against Great Britain. Yep. And you actually had two close losses out of the three. Yeah. Uh, you are right in the games. Yeah. But that was right the, in the first one and... Yeah. Um, for for the you know for one error probably that um, conceded them a try, mm-hmm. um, yeah. So I mean, it's a fine line. It's but, such a uh, fine line, <laughs> but um, it doesn't you know it doesn't change anything. I uh, guess it was the second game that kind of broke the camel's yeah, back. Yeah, Forty four nil. Yeah, series on the line. Yeah, if you won that, the series is on. Probably the the the, yeah. uh, the one memory from the first test, so that was Sam's, Sam Burgess's first test. Oh, wow. Um, so he came off the bench and Fooey was hitting, Fooey Fooey Moi Moi was hitting the ball up from a oh, mile back and wow. Sam, Sam Burgess come out of the clouds and... Clobbered him. Yeah. Sam Burgess, in my opinion, is one of the greatest forwards of all time. I so, think he's incredible. That's, you know? That series, so they had a forward pack of Jamie Peacock, uh, Terry Newton... Yep. James Graham, oh, man. Sam Burgess, Gareth Ellis, Jeez. Adrian Morley. Crazy. Um, That's a decent team, mate. Paul, Paul Lachlan. Uh, McLaughlin? Uh, the one from yeah. Wigan, the, the lock. Um, so those blokes, when when they stood in the tunnel, like, fair dinkum, our, it was, 
they were all six foot three, six foot four. Um, <laughs> Built like a brick shit you house. Know, you know, yeah. Our blokes weren't given in, yeah. but they, they were, you know, I don't know that there'd been a better uh, English Ford pack. And they're at home. Oh, well, you, you know, know, that's as that well. happens. But, yeah. you know, that's, uh, yeah. The, and yeah. then, you know, uh, the likes of Sinfield and Maguire. And, yeah. Yeah, Roby and... Far out, yeah. some pretty massive names. But yeah, again, like you guys were actually in the series, like two of the matches. The middle match didn't go so well. Do you, do you know what just happened in that match? Like yeah, 44 I got, nil. Uh, I haven't got a great recollection of, okay. to be honest. And I'm not just saying that, but yeah. um, you know, if I if there was something there, well, it's just one of those days. It yeah. just didn't happen. Yeah, yeah, no fair play. Um, but what was the feelings through the camp on the tour? Like when things weren't going your way, was it still a case of "come on, boys"? Heads yeah, up, well, let's do this. I mean, we had um, along um, other than myself. There was obviously Gary, James Lulawai, Sam Panapa. Yeah. So you know they they've been on numerous Kiwi tours, yeah. those blokes, and they know you know they know how things rock and yeah. all the rest of it. So um, for me, I, I this this was all new to me. Yeah. Um, so on on with them you know yeah. um okay things might have um outwardly there was there was no blow ups okay. as such you know um yeah. but obviously some players um it wasn't for them you know? yeah some a lot of frustrations in the camp i suppose that yeah, leaked well, out in the media and i'm about, not saying yeah, well, yeah yeah there wasn't um i, I don't know if, if there was too many but um Maybe um, if we'd had some more experience around yeah, it, um, yeah. it may have been different um, in the respect of the communication between the groups. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the big elephant in the room for me was what I heard on the news was it was David Kidwell. And yeah. Well, David. Roy Satasi were like Gary Kimball's got to go. That was yeah the big well, thing I, that came out of that. David Kidwell. Um, so he played in the All Golds game mm-hmm. and he left just after that because um, unfortunately his mother was sick and he yeah. was coming home. So Roy, I mean, I've spoken to Roy since um, yeah. and yeah, no problem there. Okay. Yeah, see, I just wondered if it was a media blowing up thing because you get that all Oh, the time. yeah, well, they, yeah, they are going to They take one little yeah. thing, they turn the it thing into this was, massive thing. The thing that was disappointing and I heard some stuff when I got home and Radio Sport was obviously big then and they just kept playing stuff from Gary over and over, like yeah. um, trying to take the piss, and yeah. you know, oh, I felt sorry can, for Gary. It yeah, was horrible, you know, well, to watch. We all did. Yeah. Um, the thing was that they're doing this, and Gary's got no right to reply. No, you know, and they're just taking the piss, and and I went right off, uh, right off them. The, because you know, ultimately, I think I mean, I, 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 uh, I question the the caliber of the people doing it to be fair yeah absolutely i just feel sorry for coaches when they cop what the players did on the yeah, field like yeah. the players are the ones out there missing tackles giving away penalties oh yeah not doing their job but the yeah. coach cops it you yeah. know and i just found it was a pretty pretty yeah tough it was a great New Zealand i mean league. yeah it was, it was it was a great time for me i mean i i got to live with james for about seven weeks you know mm-hmm. and you just couldn't live with a with a better bloke. It's pretty know. cool, isn't it? Yeah, pretty cool, mate. I'd, this is uh, this is what it's like over there. Like, there was three things that we done religiously, and this is getting off the football a bit, but no, this is good. You know, I had to get something out of it. Let, you let's know, hear the but, positives of yeah, the tour. Yeah, well, yeah. there were three things that James and I did religiously every day. At six o'clock, we'd be up and go to the gym. Mm-hmm. Um, then after dinner, we'd go for walks. So we stayed the first three weeks in first three weeks in Leeds. So we'd go for a walk every night after dinner and bearing in mind this is October, getting into November in England, so it's dark about four o'clock. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> the other third thing we'd do was um, we'd visit a charity shop. He's a great charity shopper, James. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> and, but one night we were going for a walk around Leeds and uh, as I say, it's dark and we're we're walking down the street and there's three or four blokes coming towards us. I don't know how old they were. They're about 18, 19. Yeah. And they're walking towards us. We're just walking. We had no Kiwi gear or anything on. 
and uh, they walk past us, and this kid turns around and goes, Luloi, Luloi. Yeah. And, and James turns around and acknowledge them, and they come back, and they're all over them, and this kid says to him, my dad's got photos of you at oh, home. Oh, wow. You know? So those, those kids had seen these photos of James, probably 85 when he was over, or mid-80s yeah. when he was over there, and this kid had recognised them on the street. That's it's, amazing. Yeah, it's cool, you know. That's super cool. Yeah. And he's, he is the best bloke. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Was there any other good positives you took out of that tour? I mean, it's it's an incredible feat, like to be on a oh, Kiwis tour yeah, as a coach. All, you know? It was all good, but it yeah. was uh, yeah, it was just great being in yeah. in their company and Sam and uh, and James and Gary, yeah. you know, for yeah. for that so did you, of time. Did you stay coaching in that Kiwi system after the tour, or was it? No, nah, that was it. The exit. Yeah. 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 So um, what I'd actually done was. Uh, because I thought <laughs> initially we were gonna, we you know we were coaching in two thousand and seven, two thousand and eight. Mm-hmm. And, um, so I thought, well, I better be, I better be co- doing some coaching of some sort. Yeah. But Dave Perkins, who had joined myself and Brent um, in the um, in the Canterbury Bulls team, um, he he was going to coach Hornby, but he had a job whereby he couldn't commit to being either there all the time or being there at six o'clock at night when training started. Okay. So we decided to do that together in 2008 so that I'd be doing some sort of coaching yep. at Hornby. Um, I did that. It was um, it was a mistake. Okay. Um, right. And then I uh, coached again at Horsall uh, 2009, 2010 for 2010 was going to be the 50th um, Jubilee. Or wow. Anniversary and um, Jeff once again Jeff Whittaker yeah got me there and um, the prodigal son well, it wasn't um, again yeah it didn't it wasn't successful but once again um, we lost uh, we lost Shane Byers early in the okay. season with a dislocated shoulder that kept him out for the whole year and every team's got to have some glue and he was it yeah right so that's pretty much the end of your coaching path at that point 2010 that's yeah it. And that's sayonara. Mm. Yeah. Wow, what an amazing career though! Like you've been all the way up to the highs oh, of the Kiwis, enjoyable. and yeah. a lot of good premierships and friends and yeah. memories along oh, the way. Yeah, I mean, just to, yeah to to have the the uh, memories and all the rest of it, and just one one aside really is it's how it works. You run into people every now and then. Like I hadn't seen Ross Taylor for thirty years. Yeah, my wife and I were in holiday a couple of years ago and we were at Mount uh, Mount Monganui yep. and uh, we're staying in a hotel there and I walked down the, walked down the corridor this day and I thought you know, I think I know that bloke but then he didn't think any more, anything more of it the next morning we're going out for a walk and um, this bloke's out the front of the hotel and he looks at me and I look at him and they go <laughs> snap Ross said Phil I said Ross <laughs> so we had a bit of a quick chat and we made arrangements to meet at a bar around the corner nice. and so you haven't seen this bloke for 30 years he was an adversary and you know yeah. uh, <laughs> it was you know it was it was all on in those days when Horsall played on me yep. and to sit down and have a beer after 30 years it's, it's pretty, pretty good that's pretty, pretty cool good. yeah that's amazing right so let's finish with a few fun questions Who's going to win the NRL in 2024? Broncos. Oh, it's a big call, but I like it. I like it. And will Linwood win Canterbury Comp again this year? Was it five or six in a row now? Uh, well, yeah, I don't. No, I don't know. Um, you'd have to say no. It's got to, it's got to end sometime. It's got to end all, all good things come to an end. <laughs> okay. What's your favourite TV show? Trackside. Trackside. And I and I don't punt. <laughs> That's interesting. No, no, I just, yeah, I just, I just like if, if I was at home on this Saturday afternoon watching, yep. I'd be watching the races from Wellington. I just, uh, just, love, just love the horses. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Very last question. If you were on death row, what would your final meal be? Fish and chips. Yes, good Kiwi boy loves yeah. his fish and chips. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time and sharing your career with us. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating hearing about everything from start to finish. Your playing days, which I bet not many people know about, out in the wider community as such. Um, it's been an absolute learning curve for me as well. It's been bloody fantastic. No Thanks, Dave. Yeah, man. So uh, thank you to all the people watching at home. 
Um, this has been Phil Prescott, back in the day on the couch with me, your host Dave. Uh, make sure you get on the YouTube and the Facebook page, join all the social platforms so we can grow the channel and make sure these stories are heard out there. So again, thank you very much and we'll see you next time for kickoff. Full time.